So 19th of the subjects is here for you. So you're done with all the other 18 subjects, INICET recap. And we are into the last of the subjects, the mother of all specialities and that's internal medicine. Internal medicine recap for INICET this time around is uh, slightly different from the one that we did during mid-year. I think that was a time when COVID was at its peak and we were basically not in a good frame of mind. Right now, it's not that everything is good, but still things have started to get better. We're doing this from our studio at Bengaluru. And uh, I think we are more free now to travel and we are actually going to the hospital working more. So I think it's much more positivity in the air. And as far as the students are concerned, it's like getting into the heat of the battle. And uh, you're being bombarded with advices from all corners. So I myself not trying too much to go into that. Um, this discussion is slightly different from the one that we have had previously because there is a lot of research that has gone into this discussion. We have actually structured it in such a way that you can see chapter-wise discussion of questions, showing you exactly from where in the module these questions have come, how much weightage each chapter has, and how much watching a module or watching the videos can actually help you. So this is a very structured discussion in contrast to the original module that you see on the app, which is very much in free spirit, whatever I feel at that point in time I discuss, this is not that way. And you can actually see that from medicine, and from what we have discussed, you have a big chunk of questions, almost 65 questions I plan to discuss today, so that's why we're going very fast. Okay, now, uh, what about this exam? This exam is actually, as I said, very familiar terrain. If you have a good vehicle with you, I think the occasional bumps you can get on. It's not much of a problem. In a core competitive race, this is very, very important. Why? Because whatever said and done, if a question comes at a level that is one step above what you have studied, you will not be able to answer, whether it is you, me or anyone for that matter. We will be 100% able to answer questions that are one step below what we have studied. That's also going to be very true. The problem is with questions which are at the same level as we have studied, which in the heat of the battle, in the stress of the situation, when I mean, you get a question which is in between, say, anatomy and community medicine, you have a medicine question, and you're almost about to complete your exam with little time, whether you're able to answer questions which are at the same level as you've studied, that is the challenge. And that is why it is imperative that we study at a level which is slightly above the exam. Because unless and until we do that, we will not be able to answer these questions, which are very simple, but in the heat of the exam, we get it wrong. So that's why I know it myself and have done it deliberately also. The modules are actually slightly a step above the original exam. But that is to ensure that even if you watch these modules during sleep and without any kind of a focus, okay, still you will be able to get these questions right. And that is basically the value of watching videos as well as the MCQ videos. Because if you are actually, uh, if you if you follow them properly without even taking any effort, I think, to actively learn. Active learning is your question bank and your GTs. That is when you are learning very actively. Passively, if you watch the videos, I think, it's good enough to crack a majority of these questions as we shall actually see. So let us start off. This is a system-wise recap. I'm starting off with the uh, respiratory system. There's no big reason to that. Just thought of starting with the respiratory system this time. That's it. The weightage for respiratory system for INICT 2020 was four questions. Four questions were asked from respiratory system. And you can see that all the four questions have been actually discussed. All the four questions are actually part of the videos. And all the four questions are very simple and they're very straightforward also. Okay, now let us see the first of the questions, which is a PFT question on COPD. And these are two slides which I have actually shown in my videos, which you can even see in your notes. And this is a straight pick from here. So if you've actually what is it, seen the videos, even when you when you sleep, I think you should be able to answer this question. Let us see. The first question, which is on PFT in COPD. Okay, which of the following is correct about COPD? Now I think it's very, very simple. We are starting off our discussion with this pyrometer at hand. Okay, and this is spirometer which is actually helping us to decipher a lot of things. Before we go into the spirometer in detail, let us quickly see the three types of lung diseases that we have. We have obstructive airway diseases, we have restrictive lung diseases, and we also have vascular diseases of the lung. So we have restrictive, obstructive and vascular. Vascular prototype example is pulmonary hypertension. Okay, obstructive, you have five examples. Okay. COPD, of course, bronchial asthma, then bronchiolitis. That's why I say everybody knows COPD and bronchial asthma, so it doesn't have much of a value. Bronchiolitis, bronchiectasis, and cystic fibrosis. These are the five examples. Correct. Under COPD, we have three headings. One is chronic bronchitis. Second is emphysema. And third one is small airway disease. So third one is small airway disease. Correct. Under restrictive, you divide it into intraparenchymal restrictive lung disease. Okay, intraparenchymal restrictive lung disease, which is your interstitial lung disease. Then you have your extraparenchymal restrictive lung disease, which we divide it into a neuromuscular issue and a chest wall issue. 
A neuromuscular issue typical example we study for the exam is myasthenia gravis. Chest wall issue typical we study for the exam is kyphoscoliosis. So these are the so many headings. Correct. Fine. So you know this. How are we going to interpret them with the help of a spirometer? The spirometer, the first thing that the spirometer actually tells us is our forced vital capacity or what we call as our FVC forced vital capacity. What is the meaning of this forced vital capacity? Forced vital capacity means the maximum amount of air that you can exhale after taking a deep forceful maximal inspiration, which means that when I take a deep forceful maximal inspiration, my tidal volume plus my inspirator reserve volume will go inside. Forceful expiration means I will exhale out my expirator reserve volume also, which means that this will come to 500 ml plus 3000 ml plus average I'm saying 1000 ml. So on an average 4.5 liters would be my forced vital capacity. Correct. The problem with this forced vital capacity is that you may be having a disease, you may be exhaling out this 4.5 liters in 20 seconds. I may not be having any disease, I may be exhaling this 4.5 liters in 5 seconds. Normally, a person should take around 5 seconds to exhale out this 4.5 liters. But because we are not bringing time into the equation, some may be actually very healthy, some may be actually very sick. They may be taking 20 seconds to exhale out this 4.5 liters, but we can't say. Somebody exhaling out this 4.5 liters in 20 seconds will also be having a report, FVC 4.5 liters. We think it is normal. Somebody who might have done that in 5 seconds, in support also FVC 4.5 liters. We may think that is also normal, this is also normal, so we may get foxed. Okay, so that's why it's very, very important to know what is called FEV1. That means in the first one second, how much are you able to exhale out? In a normal person, because it is from the trachea bronchi, etc., which is effort dependent expiration, he will be able to exhale out approximately 80% in the first one second itself, which means that in the first one second itself, you will be able to exhale out approximately 4 liters. So you can say 4.5 to 5 liters is your vital capacity. About 4 liters, you will be able to exhale out in the first one second. And we plot this very, very important ratio called called the FEV1 by FEC ratio. We plot this very important ratio called FEV1 by FEC ratio, which is generally more than 80%, which is generally more than 80%. So from the spirometer, the first thing that we are going to see is our FEV1, our FEC and this FEV1 by FEC ratio, which is generally more than 80%. Correct, FEC is generally around 4.5 to 5 liters, FEV1 is 80% of that, that is around 4 liters in the first second. Correct. Again, flow rate, nothing we are talking about. We are just talking about this FEV1 and FEC. Now, let us see what will actually happen. What will happen in an obstructive lung disease? This again, I have discussed very, very clearly. In an obstructive lung disease, you are having two phases. The early phase is the phase of hyperinflation. And then you have the late phase, which is the phase of air trapping. So, you have this hyperinflation phase. You have this air trapping phase. Air trapping phase is actually the late phase, hyperinflation phase is the early phase. This hyperinflation phase, what actually happens is, so during inspiration, there is nothing much of a problem. It's all very easy. You're actually taking in air. Why it is not much of a problem? Because during a normal inspiration, what are the forces that actually prevent you from taking in air? There are two major forces. One is your surface tension, which is overcome by your surfactant. Second is called your elastic recoil pressure. Okay, your elastic recoil pressure. Because of the loss of elastic attachments, what happens is that in a COPD-like situation, there is so much of a fall in elastic recoil pressure. Because there is a so much of a fall in elastic recoil pressure, it is very, very easy to inflate the lungs. Because it is very easy to inflate the lungs, that's why we say that the compliance is actually very high. That means it's very easy to inflate the lungs. When it is very, very easy to inflate the lungs, if you look at your functional residual capacity or you look at your residual volume okay functional residual capacity or residual volume why i'm telling this separately is because you need a plethysmograph to actually look for this with your normal spirometer you will not be able to measure residual volume and anything connecting residual volume so you need a plethysmograph to look for this what is the meaning of your functional residual capacity functional residual capacity is the amount of air that is left in your lungs at the end of a normal expiration so at the end of a normal expiration you will be having your residual volume and your expirator reserve volume which is being left in your lungs. That means the amount of air left in your lungs at the end of a normal expiration. And residual volume is the amount of air left in your lungs at the end of maximum maximal expiration. So maximal expiration. Correct. Fine. When you're trying to forcefully expire, you tell me what will happen. When you're trying to forcefully expire, you are having something called the theory of dynamic compression of airways, which occurs in a COPD or in an obstructive lung disease, which is because the driving pressure that is required to drive air out of your system is a sum total of your intrapleural pressure and your elastic recoil pressure. 
okay this intrapleural pressure becomes positive only in one scenario that is your forced expression so this intrapleural pressure plus your elastic recoil pressure must be above your airway pressure to drive air out of your system but in a case of copd or an obstructive disease as i have said this elastic recoil pressure is actually very less because this elastic recoil pressure is less there are many times where the sum of intrapleural pressure and elastic recoil pressure tends to go below your airway pressure when it goes below your airway pressure what happens is that your airways will close okay your airways will close when your airways close whatever you try and do later on you cannot actually exhale out this air which means that this air will be actually trapped behind this is what we call as air trapping which means that even from the initial phase of expiration onwards we are not able to drive out the whole amount of air why are we not able to drive out the whole amount of air that is because of this theory of dynamic compression and what does dynamic compression say only when your intrapleural plus your elastic recoil pressure goes above your airway pressure can we exhale air out here what is the problem elastic recoil pressure is actually very very low which means that whatever setting you take residual volume has to be always high because you will not be able to exhale out the whole air and because residual volume is high and your hyper inflating the lungs functional residual capacity is going to be obviously very high because you've already taken in more air than normal and you are not able to actually leave out that air which means both of these are going to be high here so frc is also going to be high rv is also going to be high and you need what to measure that you need a plethysmograph to measure that then what is the difference between these two stages the difference between the two stages is that in this phase called hyperinflation when you are giving the patient time that means you are giving the patient 10 seconds 15 seconds 20 seconds 25 seconds at the end of 25 seconds this guy may be able to exhale out the whole air that means with a lot of effort at the end of this time he may be able to exhale out air which is the reason why fvc in him is literally normal okay you are giving him lot of time lot of time so fvc will be normal but in this air trapping phase whatever happens he cannot exhale out the whole air so fvc decreases so in this hyperinflation phase fvc is normal in this air trapping phase fvc decreases correct in both phases what happens residual volume will be high in both phases what happens frc will also be high here also what will be happening residual volume will be high frc will be high correct the crux question that you have to understand here is the total lung capacity total lung capacity which includes everything okay will be increased here because it is proportional to residual volume everything is going to increase but here because your forced vital capacity is actually come down forced vital capacity plus residual volume is actually your tlc correct because you exhale out everything then what is left behind is your residual volume here residual volume is increasing so total lung capacity increases here although that increases fvc is actually coming down so tlc is more or less normal here tlc is more or less normal here so these are the two phases hyperinflation phase air trapping phase here in this question they have not mentioned phase which is this is a phase but generally these are the two phases you have the patient in hyperinflation phase for a long time and you have the patient then going into the air trapping phase correct so once again summarizing in a patient with copd what happens FEV1 by FEC ratio is going to be very low. FEC is going to be normal. RV, FRC are going to be very high, and TLC is also going to be high. This is the phase of hyperinflation. Correct. When this goes to air trapping, this is the same, but FEC gets reduced. This is the same. TLC is more or less normal. This is called air trapping. most of the patients are in hyperinflation phase only at the end you will be having something called air trapping so let's go back to this question increased tlc is correct increased vital capacity never it is either normal or it is reduced decreased fe1 by fe0 ratio perfect increased frc correct which means that options a c d are correct that's what i'm saying even in your sleep if you watch the video it's a very very simple question it's a very very simple question now what i have actually discussed in the video up and above this is that if the patient's fev1 by fec comes to be normal then you are ruling out obstructive okay that's why the first thing that you look for is your fe1 by fec if it is normal you're ruling out obstructive but please keep in mind that small airway diseases can actually fox you okay small airway diseases can have a normal fev1 by fec ratio so that is something that you have to keep in mind to figure out small airway diseases we need what is called maximal mid expiratory flow rate okay maximal mid expiratory flow rate that is what we call as fef 25 to 
okay fef 2575 forced expiratory flow rate in the middle part of your fec that is fef 2575 that's a flow rate that means it brings time also into the equation now for practical purposes if fe1 by fec is normal you're ruling out obstructive so when you're ruling out obstructive then what is actually left behind you can have something called restrictive okay and you can have something called vascular you can have restrictive you can have vascular so can an fev1 by fec in restrictive be normal what is the pathophysiology there? In restrictive, I told you there is increased elastic recoil pressure because of fibrosis. In obstructive, it was decreased elastic recoil pressure. Here it is increased elastic recoil pressure, which means that there is decrease in compliance. So there is decrease in compliance, which means that your tidal volume plus inspirator reserve volume plus your expirator reserve volume is equal to your forced vital capacity. Whatever happens, this value has to be low. Whatever happens, this value has to be low means you cannot actually take in enough air which means that there is no way in the world that you can have a normal fvc here your fvc has to be low your fvc has to be low and there is no major issue of dynamic compression so this fev1 by fvc ratio will be normal or even be increased there is no issue of dynamic compression so fv1 by fvc ratio will be normal or even be increased but remember your fvc is going to be 100 percent low Correct. So if even by FEC ratio decreased obstructive, if even by FEC ratio normal or increased with FEC low is always equal to restrictive. If even by FEC ratio normal or increased. This pretty much sums up the whole story. Okay. This is actually speaking very, very easy at this point to study. And just the opposite of obstruction. In restriction, we'll see what happens to FRC and those things. But remember, FRC is going to be very, very low. Why is FRC going to be very, very low? Because there is very, very high increased elastic recoil pressure. It's very difficult to actually inflate the lung. Amount of lung air that is left in the lung at the end of inspiration itself is actually very less. So automatically the amount of air that will be left in the lung at the end of a normal expiration is going to be very, very low. So FRC is going to be low. So this is very, very clear. So FE1 by FEC is normal. FRC is going to be low. FE1 by FEC is going to be normal or increased. FRC is going to be low. And compliance is going to be on the lower side. Correct. So now let's go back to this. FEV1 by FEC in a patient normal or increased means then you are actually thinking of restrictive. How do you know that it is a restrictive? FVC will be very, very low. FVC will be very, very low. Okay. And you also know that your FRC is also going to be low. FRC is also going to be low. Correct. Fine. In this case, you need to differentiate into whether it is an intraparenchymal issue like an ILD or it is an extra parenchymal issue to differentiate between intra parenchymal issue and extra parenchymal issue it's very 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 simple we need to look into diffusion and that is dlco dlco is going to be 100 percent reduced in intra parenchymal dlco is going to be normal in extra parenchymal so that's very easy dlco is going to be normal in extra parenchymal dlco is going to be reduced in intra parenchymal so FE and FEC ratio is normal or increased. FEC is low with the DLCO low is equal to intraparent chemical restrictive lung disease. FE and FEC ratio normal or increased with an FEC that is low with the DLCO that is normal is equal to extra parent chemical restrictive lung disease. Very, very clear. And the last one is vascular. And under vascular, you have pulmonary hypertension. And vascular, remember, FVV1 by FEC ratio will be normal. FVC will also be normal. This is the crux point. FVC is also normal, but because it is a vascular issue, DLCO reduced. Correct. So FE1 by FVC ratio decreased, obstructive. FE1 by FVC ratio normal or increased with an FVC low, very, very important, is restrictive. Inside that low DLC, intraparenchymal, normal DLC, extraparenchymal. FE1 by FVC ratio, FVC, everything normal, only DLCO decreased is vascular, that is pulmonary hypertension. Done. This is in sum total. Now, the last point inside that, which if you want, you can remember, is extra parenchymal has two types. That is, you are having a muscle issue, like a myasthenia, and you are having something like a chest wall issue, which is your kyphoscoliosis. Kyphoscoliosis. Okay. Fine. The crux point is about residual volume. Okay. Residual volume. And this ratio called residual volume by TLC ratio. Residual volume by TLC ratio. Residual volume to be affected, you need a parenchymal disease. I'm making it very, very, very clear. Which means that residual volume decreases only in ILD. Okay, only in intraparenchymal. In both these cases, residual volume is going to be normal. Residual volume is going to be normal. Correct? There is no difference. And sometimes even increased also. 
Okay. Because muscles are not working, sometimes it may be even increased also. In myasthenia, it may be even slightly increased. You can actually take like that, but it's never going to be decreased. Okay. This ratio what we are using is called the RV by TLC ratio. So, what we need to understand over here is that in a chest wall issue, okay, in a chest wall issue, because the muscles are normal as well as the parenchyma is normal, the TLC is maintained. TLC is maintained in a chest wall issue. Whereas, because the muscles are abnormal, TLC is reduced in a muscular issue. So, in a chest wall issue, because the muscle and parenchyma is normal, TLC is reduced. Whereas, sorry, in a chest wall issue, because the muscle and parenchyma is normal, TLC is maintained. In a neuromuscular issue, because the muscles are very important, TLC is reduced. Which means that if you plot this ratio called RV by TLC ratio, in both conditions, RV is normal. But in a neuromuscular issue like a myasthenia gravis, I told you the TLC is reduced. So, this ratio increases. Or what we say RV by TLC ratio increases in a neuromuscular problem. RV by TLC ratio is almost unchanged in a chest wall issue. RV by TLC ratio unchanged in a chest wall issue. Okay, so look for F1 by FEC. If that is normal or increased, then you're ruling out obstructive. If it is that is reduced, means you go to obstructive. If that is normal or increased, go into FEC. If FEC is reduced, it is restrictive. FEC is normal, then go for vascular. Under restrictive, look for DLC or then intraparenchymal. DLC normal, extra parenchymal. Inside that RB by TLC ratio increase myasthenia. RB by TLC ratio normal, then think of chest wall issues. Then F1 by FEC normal, FEC normal, DLC alone reduced, think of vascular. Once again, I have discussed the whole thing just because it's very, very important. And you know that we have actually discussed one step above that in the exam, which makes it a very simple exercise. That's what I'm again and again telling you. On a given day, it is not practically possible for you to keep actively studying all the time. Okay, so your active study period, maybe say three or four hours, but you're very actively studying. You do your QBank, you revise very actively, you solve the test series, you solve the papers. It requires a lot of concentration. There are going to be times when you're feeling fatigued, you're wanting to sleep, you want to relax, etc. Those times you think of me, you just take the video modules and you just watch. Automatically, so many things will go into your system because they're being emphasized and re-emphasized and re-emphasized. My own classmates have actually come to listen to my class, feel that I have actually repeated things unnecessarily again and again. So they have told me in a live class, they are just keeping on repeating again and again, but that does pay dividends. Okay. We go to question number two. Which of the following is a smoking related ILD? Okay. And this is the slide that I have actually shown. You can see the video and you can even see your notes. This is a slide smoking associated ILD and three names are written over here and those three names have come for the exam also. So this is what I can do. This is only what I can do. So three names and the three names have come for the exam. Respiratory bronchiolitis associated ILD, pulmonary lung and hand cystocytosis, desquamative interstitial pneumonia and that is why options A, C and D are actually correct over here. Generally, smoking is not a risk factor for ILD, but there are three very, very important smoking associated ILDs. In fact, this is also a slide that I have actually shown. This was my next slide. Okay, you can actually see the slide. Okay, and I have actually gone on to discuss one step above or one step more than what is essentially required from this. Even if you just know the smoking associated ILDs by name, it's more than enough. But we have actually gone one step ahead and discussed one, one, one point about each of these smoking associated ILDs. And that has not come for the exam, just the names have actually come for the exam. So be very, very, very clear with this that we have now got these patterns. So ILD on the whole is a diffuse parenchyma lung fibrosis. The name ILD is actually wrong because we're saying only interstitium. It's not that way. Your alveoli, your interstitium, your lung parenchyma, that is your alveoli plus interstitium is getting fully fibrosed. Except for the airways, almost everything is getting fibrosed. Now we are having ILDs of unknown etiology and ILDs of known etiology. So these ILDs of unknown etiology are actually much, much more than the ILDs of known etiology. So ILDs of unknown etiology are much, much more than the ILDs of known etiology. Among the ILDs of unknown etiology, they are together called idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. Okay, they are together called idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. So this idiopathic interstitial pneumonia is the most common type of ILD if you take it in that way. That means they are the ILDs of unknown etiology that together called idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. In this idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, the first one is called idiopathic fibrosis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is histologically called usual interstitial pneumonia. This is the most common pattern of pneumonia that you see, most common pattern of ILD that you see. Usual interstitial pneumonia or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis which comes under which heading idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. Correct. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis 
the key points that you have to be remembering about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis first and foremost most of the time we will not be able to attribute a cause the only cause that has been attributed so far for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is rheumatoid arthritis the only cause that has been attributed so far is rheumatoid arthritis second point it's very chronic okay it is seen in around 50 years it is seen in males more than females okay it is seen in males more than females third point it is associated with dry cough exertional dyspnea the two characteristic symptoms dry cough exertional dyspnea and the classical well core crackles which are fine inspiratory crackles from mid inspiration to late inspiration to early expiration etc all that we have actually seen crux finding clinical is to always look for clubbing always look for clubbing okay now the crux ct questions that you have to know from idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis because it's always a comparison with the next pattern that we'll be seeing so there is always loss of lung architecture there is always loss of lung architecture there will be honeycombing okay there will be cysts there will be reticular infiltrates and there will be traction bronchiectasis okay so honeycombing cysts reticular infiltrates traction bronchiectasis and even septal thickening okay you have septal thickening these are all the crux findings that you see in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Loss of lung architecture, intralobular, interlobular, septal thickening, traction bronchiectasis. You'll be seeing honeycombing, you'll be seeing a lot of cysts, etc. All these findings are seen in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is the most common pattern. The second most common pattern is called NSIP or non-specific interstitial pneumonia. This non-specific interstitial pneumonia, first and foremost, is seen in females more than males. It has got a more subacute onset. And it is generally associated with connective tissue diseases. It is also associated with drugs. Okay. Connective tissue diseases. It is also associated with drugs. And when you think of CTDs, the first CTD that has to come to your mind is scleroderma. Okay. Another CTD that has to come to your mind is Jogren syndrome, where you actually have what is called LIP, which is a subtype of NSIP. Okay. LIP, which is actually now a subtype of NSIP. So, if you say LIP or NSIP, that's fine in case of Jogren. Correct. Here, will you see distortion of lung architecture? No. Will you see cysts? No. Will you see uh, anything like a honeycombing? No. Will you see traction bronchiectasis? No. You can see reticular infiltrates. Of course, that you can see. The most classical finding will be ground glass opacification. Most classical finding will be ground glass opacification. Okay. Fine. Very, very clear. The third one is called COP or cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Okay. Cryptogenic organizing pneumonia as far as cryptogenic organizing pneumonia is concerned what are the key points it is seen mostly in the elderly population it presents as consolidation many a times it presents as consolidation just like a pneumonia non-resolving pneumonia one thing that you have to think is cryptogenic organizing pneumonia and the most important disease that has to come to your mind is polymyositis dermatomyositis okay Remember that in polymyositis, dermatomyositis is also most common pattern of ILDs NSIP. In all connective tissue diseases except RA, it is NSIP. But in cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, if you ask what is the most common pattern seen, that is polymyositis, dermatomyositis. These are the three common patterns. So three very, very common patterns. One, two, three. Then we have Langerhansel histiocytosis, desquamative interstitial pneumonia, as well as respiratory bronchitis associated ILD. These are the next three patterns and what is most classical of them, they are seen in smokers. As far as Langerhansel histocytosis is concerned, what did I tell you? It is seen in young males, very, very important. It is characterized by the presence of nodules and cysts. This is very, very crucial. There is no other condition where you are getting nodules till now. I, told, I haven't told any other condition. It is seen in smokers and there is always a tendency for spontaneous pneumothorax okay always a tendency for spontaneous pneumothorax okay fine discommative interstitial pneumonia you have basal ground glass opacification which is in a smoker okay centrilobular nodules okay plus bronchial wall thickening in a smoker that is respiratory bronchiolitis associated IL bronchial wall thickening in a smoker these have not come for the exam langanal cystocytosis is very very important the other two have not come but the names have been asked now 
Correct. So we saw three very common patterns. We, throw, we saw three quite unfamiliar patterns also. Whenever you think of spontaneous pneumothorax in a young male, you must be thinking of Langerhans listocytosis. When you think of spontaneous pneumothorax in a young female, what should come to your mind? Pulmonary lymphangiomyometrosis. There is another condition that can produce ILD, pulmonary lymphangiomyometrosis. And that may be many a times linked to tuberous sclerosis also. That is associated with spontaneous pneumothorax in females. This is associated with spontaneous pneumothorax in males. Okay. So loss of lung architecture. Honeycombing, cystic traction bronchitis, UIP. Ground glass specification, NSIP. Consolidation, you think of, you think of cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. In cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, I think if you remember clearly, there is something called reverse halocyne. Halocyne you see in aspergillosis, reverse halocyne or at all sign you see in cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Where you have a ground glass specification that is actually surrounded by a consolidation. It's called reverse halocyne. Then of course you come to Langerhans listocytosis, discomative interstitial pneumonia, respiratory bronchitis associated ILD. Okay, these are the six patterns. And then you have a seventh pattern, which is called acute interstitial pneumonia. Acute interstitial pneumonia is the most fatal one because it has got very, very bad prognosis and it is a very rapidly progressive kind of one. It is acute in onset and it is most fatal. It has got the worst, worst, worst prognosis. In fact, the same question was asked this time. DAD on biopsy. What is DAD on biopsy? Diffuse alveolar damage. Diffuse alveolar damage is the most consistent finding in an acute onset interstitial pneumonia. This acute onset interstitial pneumonia, which is classified as an acute onset ILD, is what we typically see in coronavirus also. And that is why this most classical finding, which you can actually see the same slide. This slide is not prepared by me. This slide was, say, this slide is actually my slide, but this is the same slide that you can actually see in the discussion that was done. So I have actually brought the same slide to make you understand and request you to actually go back and see this so that you get it right. I mean, you get it right next time. You can go and see and confirm the same slide has been discussed in the video also. Okay, so you see bilateral ground glass opacification, high mortality similar to ARDS. It's very similar to ARDS. That's what I told you. This is acute onset ARDS. Acute onset ARDS with media stenitis, with ham and current sound in the media stenum, etc. I told you that. And this is characterized by DAD on biopsy. DAD is because of endothelial damage. And endothelial damage produces DAD. The same pattern we see in coronavirus also. So acute interstitial pneumonia, cause not known. There are so many causes postulated. One such cause is COVID as well. And what do you see on the biopsy? You see DAD on the biopsy. Correct. So, seven patterns I have told you. UIP, NSIP, COP, discomative interstitial pneumonia, Langerhans listocytosis, and then respiratory bronchitis associated ILD, and then acute interstitial pneumonia, which is acute onset ARDS with media sanitis, with, okay, generally seen in people with some kind of an infection, especially COVID, DAD on biopsy, and no specific treatment. Okay, so that is about ILD discussion. So you see, we have discussed up and above the actual original question, but then that helps us to answer this question very easily. If I tell you these are the smoking associated ILDs and mark it up that these are the smoking associated ILDs, you may do. Some of you may be able to answer it rightly for the exam, but many others may not be able to do. That's why it's very, very important to actually go one step ahead of the exam. Okay, it's very, very, very important to keep that in mind because this is a core competitive race. In a core competitive race, only the fittest will survive. And it is for us to actually be very clear with the fact that we are fit and we are running up and above the others. Otherwise, what happens is we'll be lost in the crowd because there are so many, many, many students studying MBBS. So only very few students will be actually able to come out and excel. Okay, and it's always excellence that we are striving for. Okay, so this is to just show you what is this honeycombing. The other images I have actually discussed along with ILD. Please go back and watch. Now we see question number three. Question number three in respiratory system is a 40 year old male with a history of smoking, chronic cough, dyspnea and pleuritic chest pain for the past two years. HRCT is shown below, comment on the diagnosis. Now this is actually a radiology question. The actual image I'm not very sure, but this is very close to the actual image that we got. This question is actually making you think of See, you know the shape of the bronchiole, you know the shape of the bronchioles, respiratory as well as the terminal bronchioles, the size of the bronchioles. You see that you are having bigger, bigger, bigger size bronchioles bilaterally. So bilaterally, when you are having bronchioles and that too, they are dilated. Okay, they are dilated and it is not a central association. It's almost like you are having it everywhere. And there is a patient who has got chronic cough. Yes, so probably I think see you can't say anything significantly because this question is a radiology question. It's nothing 100% over here. Definitely it is not COPD because you're not going to have this much of dilatation in COPD. There is a patient who has gone into bronchitis. Does he have a hydrated cyst? No, multiple with slightly thickened wall. It doesn't look like a hydrated. So I'm striking off hydrated. I don't know the original image. So there are people who are saying that it was like a single big one, etc. Then you may think of hydrated. Otherwise, no. And there is no history in this question, which is making you think of hydrated. Absolutely nothing. And if you are having something like a hydrated, then your saline cough, 
cough it's like kind of uh, more or less like coughing out saline etc should be coming then cystic fibrosis can produce bronchiectasis 40 years i'm not thinking of cystic fibrosis much and cystic fibrosis is mostly central bronchiectasis there is nothing suggestive of central bronchiectasis here so it's like a diffuse bronchiectatic pattern that you are seeing it's not a typical signet ring but still diffuse bronchiectatic pattern these are the images that i actually showed you so this is very similar to the image that you can actually see on the slide and that's why i feel that the same image has been actually taken for the exam also because original image and the textbook image that image is not my image that's a textbook image are pretty similar so i think it's a bronchiectasis i'm going with bronchiectasis in that question and bronchiectasis has been already discussed in great detail fourth question is on match the following now this match the following question is supposed to be the most easiest of the questions that you can actually see we have done this module called occupational lung disorder is more of a theoretical module you can just quickly go through that module asbestosis is written over here so asbestosis is written over here um, i think there should not be any kind of a problem i told you that asbestosis can involve the pleura it can involve the lung parenchyma as well as it can produce malignancies so there are three things correct whereas if you take silicosis there is no involvement in the pleura there is no malignancy there is only lung parenchyma involvement but here you are having three inside the pleura you are having pleural thickening pleural plaques etc which all of you know benign asbestos related pleural effusion which is basically any eosinophilic effusion etc is the most earliest ma manifestation it's the most earliest manifestation malignancies you know there are two kinds of malignancies which have been actually implicated the adenocarcinoma as well as the mesothelioma so that's also there lung parenchyma involvement yes is bilateral lower lobe infiltration and then that can actually progress to fibrosis that can actually progress to fibrosis right now you can actually go back to the original slide that we have seen in your in our video where we have actually started off with occupational lung disorders and i have said silicosis asbestosis cold workers pneumoconiosis and bisonosis are the four headings that we are going to discuss of silicosis is most common and the tissue reaction to the accumulation of dust in lung is basically what is called pneumoconiosis that is the name that we use together okay and then the next slide that we have gone to is exactly from where this question has actually come pleura you have well circumscribed pleural plaques that is the most common manifestation earliest manifestation is a benign asbestos related pleural effusion with mesothelial cells as well as with eosinophils and diffuse pleural thickening actually produces progressive dyspnea and chest pain the next slide you can see lung parenchymal involvement with bilateral lower lobe infiltrates with pleural plaques progressing into diffuse massive fibrosis that's a lower lobe involvement with pleural plaques going into diffuse massive fibrosis with an exertional dyspnea when that is present and a pattern on a pft that looks like a restrictive pattern so this is the same pattern of discussion that we have followed and the same question that has come for the exam also asbestosis is lower low infiltration there is no question on that so a is going to be with 3 correct i have also done another slide at the end which is probably trying to compare between lung cancer mesothelioma so you see lung cancer 20 to 30 years latency period and associated with smoking here it is more than 30 years for mesothelioma correct amphibol is the one that is most commonly implicated that you know because it is serpentine that is more common but it is less toxic amphibol is very very toxic cough and hemoptysis is basically the presentation of lung malignancy chest pain and mass is the presentation of a mesothelioma that is one of the other important points we'll come to that smoking multiplies risk this is not multiplying risk adeno or squamous or small cell but may book say adeno is most common here epithelioid variant most common microvilli desmosomes to look for with pan cytokeratin cal retinin tono filaments all this are actually part of your discussion of mesothelioma okay all that i have actually done there in detail let us go back to this question number 2 which is mesothelioma so mesothelioma how do you identify mesothelioma here so pleural effusion minus mediastinal shift So when you have a pleural effusion, which is minus a mediastinal shift, what comes to your mind? Either there could be a collapse on that side, or it could be a localized effusion, or it could be a very small effusion. Again, I come back to the slide. It's a chest pain with a mass. It's a pleural kind of an involvement. This mass may be actually in the beginning small, so it may not actually cause obstruction. Sorry, it may not actually push the mediastinum to the opposite side. So it's also very clearly explained. So let us again come back to the question. So mesothelioma is pleural effusion with minus mediastinum shift. 
Kaplan syndrome. Kaplan syndrome, I mean, I think I have told you this 10,000, 10,000 times. Under cold workers pneumoconiosis, we have discussed this Kaplan syndrome. In cold workers pneumoconiosis, you see generally small rounded opacities with pulmonary impairment. These nodules actually can actually lead on to a COPD like picture, all that I told you. Complicated cold workers pneumoconiosis is the one that actually goes into a fibrosis. And this is a slight Kaplan syndrome, is rheumatoid arthritis with these necrobiotic nodules. So that's also very, very clearly explained. Okay, so there should not be any kind of a question with that. And that is Kaplan syndrome with cold worker pneumoconiosis with rheumatoid arthritis. So what is left behind? Silicosis. Silica, I told you, involves only the lung parenchyma. You have nodules and then you have actually going to get fibrosis. And the fibrosis is predominantly going to be an upper low fibrosis. This is also a typical CT that I have shown in my own presentation. And in that CT, you can actually see nodules with diffuse ground glass opacification plus thickened septa. This is a finding that you can see in so many places. Even you can see it in ARDS, you can actually see it in a quite lot of condition. This is called the crazy payment pattern. And you can actually see this return over the crazy payment. It's a Harrison, it's a Harrison CT, the same CT I have shown in class and the same CT has actually come for the exam, not the CT, the finding. This is crazy paving, which you actually see in silicosis. So from that one module, if you watch that module, again, I'm saying not with a lot of attention. Even if you don't watch the module with attention, you can still get these questions. That is the value of watching the module. When you're doing a question bank and learning something, it is with a lot of focus, with a lot of attention, with a lot of hard work that you are understanding. In a video module, even if you are sleeping and watching, still you will be able to get these questions right because we're discussing one step above that. So the original question will be actually speaking a lot more easy. So there are four questions on respiratory system. We finished discussing that. And I think in respiratory system, we've done a very good job and have almost scored very well. Almost 100% we've scored. So I'm feeling happy for respiratory system. So with that, we move to the next one. So that is endocrine. And endocrine this time around had six questions. Let us start discussing questions on endocrinology and metabolism. Under endocrine and metabolism, which of the following is correct about the lesion shown? The same question was discussed by Rohan also because this is an ulcer and ulcer is basically anybody's game. So this has been already discussed. I just want to, I'm not very sure of the question because some people had said that it's a single option question. Some others feel that it is not a single option question. Anyway, so it's a diabetic patient who has got a sole of the foot ulcer, which is more of a punched out ulcer rather than the sloping ulcer that you get as a venous ulcer. So venous ulcers are generally on the medial malleoli. They are more sloping ulcers. So this is not anyway a venous ulcer. We've seen enough and more venous ulcers. Distal pulse absent means it should be a macro lesion. This diabetes is typically associated with small vessel involvement. It is a microangiopathy more than a macro lesion. And distal pulse absent, it should be an arterial ulcer on the dorsum of the foot. Again, absolutely not anything like that. No history given. This is a typical diabetic neuropathy ulcer. It's a typical neuropathy ulcer. And will there be microangiopathy? There will be microangiopathy also. So if you are having this option, it should be B and D. So you know what is the common pattern of diabetic neuropathy that you see? Diabetic neuropathy can have so many patterns. The most common one is a bilateral, symmetrical, small fiber, distal to proximal, neuropathy. That is lower limb predominant. So bilaterally symmetrical small fiber distal to proximal neuropathy which is lower limb predominant. So small fiber means pain, temperature, crew touch, pressure. Okay, pain, temperature, crew touch, pressure. So the patient is unable to perceive pain, unable to perceive crew touch. That's why you get ulcers there. What are the other conditions that can produce diabetic neuropathy like kind of manifestation? Same sense, same uh, bilateral symmetrical neuropathy that you get. This is a sensory more than motor. So what are the other conditions? Please go and see all the other conditions that can have a similar kind of a presentation, including leprosy, including amyloidosis, including all the vascular lesions, including arsenic poisoning, including uremia. They all produce this pattern neuropathy. So many different patterns of neuropathy I have discussed. To know the important examples for each pattern is very, very important. So relatively easy question again, but what we have actually the pains that we have taken to understand this is much more, which means that the original question becomes easy. Now, which of the following is not a cause of secondary hyperparathyroidism? So if you've not answered this question, then I think I should be stopping my work and going for something else. Primary hyperparathyroidism, secondary hyperparathyroidism, everything I have discussed so many, many times. Let's just quickly look into this. What is called primary hyperparathyroidism? Primary hyperparathyroidism is due to a parathyroid overactivity, which means that very often it is due to an adenoma. Sometimes it may be due to a hyperplasia okay 
what will happen pth is being produced in excess automatically will be having increase in serum calcium decrease in serum phosphorus and pth levels if you check for are going to be very very high correct what is secondary hyperparathyroidism secondary hyperparathyroidism is a response to low calcium so it is a response to low calcium which you typically see in ckd patients or in any other condition where a calcium level can be low so what happens pth levels are definitely going to be on the higher side here because it is a response it's secondary hyperparathyroidism you look at the calcium levels the calcium levels are going to be low even if pth increases it's still not able to regularize calcium and as you can see typically in ckd phosphorus levels are going to be on the higher side because the kidney is not working the prototype example is ckd so phosphorus levels are going to be higher side is what you are actually supposed to be doing for the exam Okay, although that is not generally a rule because depending on the cause it can change but because 97% are due to CKD you study like this. What is tertiary hyperparathyroidism that is seen in CKD patients with long standing secondary. CKD patients with long standing secondary will have autonomous activity of the parathyroid. When you have autonomous activity of the parathyroid what will happen? PTS levels will start increase, increase, increase to big levels above 1000. So phosphorus levels in CKD are already very high but now this calcium will actually start to increase. This calcium which is low will now start to increase. So PTH high, calcium high, phosphorus low primary. PTH high, calcium low, phosphorus high secondary. PTH very very high, calcium high, phosphorus high tertiary. How many times I have told you this one? I have told you this so many many times. So parathyroidism is always primary. Lithium intake is a cause of primary hyperparathyroidism that I have discussed very specifically. CKD is the cause for secondary hyperparathyroidism. Vitamin D deficiency is a cause for secondary hyperparathyroidism because it can actually produce. I don't know exactly how this question was framed. Adenoma is primary. Lithium is PTH dependent hypercalcemia. So that's also primary. This is secondary. This is secondary. So which is not a cause means parathyroidism definitely not a cause. Lithium is also not a cause. Okay, so that's it. So it's a question which is very straightforward from what we have actually seen, which we have seen. Drugs promoting bone formation among the following. Simple, simple pharmacology question. This is the slide that I have actually shown you. This is the slide that I have shown you. Incubators of bone resorption. Then I showed you stimulators of bone formation. Then I've showed you mixed mechanism. Then I've shown you adjunctive therapy. So stimulators of bone formation, I told you is PTH and everything about PTH teriparatide and abaloparatide and all those things. Strontium acts by both mechanisms, but it's not of much value. So let's see. Bisphosphonates, no. Raloxifen, no. Calcitonin, no. Teriparatide, correct. Okay, drugs promoting bone formation. There is even romasosumab now, which is a sclerostin antagonist. Those things have been discussed very well by Ranjan sir. Ranjan sir's pharmacology, INICT recall is, is a must watch. Okay, it's a must watch. I think everything is must watch. All the chapter, all the subjects are must watch. But I think if you look at the integrated core understanding of that topic and how much it has been extrapolated with the clinical subjects, I think Mayur sir and Ranjan sir have done a fantastic job. And their videos are definitely must, must watch. So teriparatide. Again, very, very important. So drugs promoting bone form. It's a very simple, straightforward big question. And there is another question on osteoporosis also. Osteoporosis is a video that has been done by both me as well as Abbas. These points are actually very much the same. Value of investigation osteoporosis, the question is not very clear. Okay, definitely DEXA is the investigation of choice. All of us have mentioned that bone scan per se has got no value because it is useful for diagnosing malignancies and metastasis. Chemical profile is going to be normal in osteoporosis. I told you calcium, phosphorus, PTH, everything will be normal in osteoporosis. It is no value. QCT quantitative CT in an era when DEXA was not there and even now in certain places we are using QCT so can't say QCT has no role. DEXA is the best value of investigation QCT also has a role but looking at a biochemical profile per se has no value because everything is going to be normal. Bone scan again I don't think has a value. This I have discussed in the video I have not mentioned the word QCT because QCT somehow I left out I did not mention that but apart from that I think if you watch the video these two questions on osteoporosis are going to be easy for you. Okay. Female presented with increased TSH, very low T4. If you don't answer this better that you jump, okay, jump from the window down because it's such a simple question. Increased TSH, low T4 is hypothyroidism. The only option that you can actually have from here is Hashimoto. Now, this is the table that I have discussed. We have actually discussed this in great detail. Each one we have actually seen and discussed. Please go back and watch this particular module. TSH increased, free T4, normal, free T3, normal. Okay, that is the first possibility. Never look at total T4, total T3. It has no value. That's the first thing I told you. Always it is free T4 and free T3. So when only TSH is increased, okay, and nothing else is, I mean, abnormal. First thing that you see is a subclinical hypo. Then, of course, recovery from acute illness. Recovery from acute illness. That again I have discussed, okay. I have discussed that in great detail. Now, TSH increased, free T4 decreased, free T3 decreased. This is the 
most common one, primary hypothyroidism. Correct. TSH is increased, free T4 increased, free T3 increased, which means that you are having a TSH secreting adenoma of the pituitary. There can also be a similar situation in what is called thyroid hormone resistance. So please go back and see what is thyroid hormone resistance. Okay. Now, when you have a decreased TSH, decreased free T4, decreased free T3, which means you are having a hypo, central hypopituitarism. In a central hypopituitarism, sometimes the free TSH may be normal, sorry, TSH may be normal also. So even if TSH is normal, if free T3, free T4 are reduced, always think of hypothalamic pituitary cause. TSH is decreased, free T4 increased, free T3 increased, which basically is thyroid oxycosis. You can even get it in pregnancy. You can get it to the high latitude form mode, etc. So please go back and see this. There are so many caveats in this also, which due to the lack of time, we are not discussing so much. But I think if you know this in a, in a pretty decent way, I think you are safe for the exam. And what is actually called is acute critical patient in the ICU. We never really look for this. Why don't we actually look for this? Because it's going to be very, very much altered because deadenase is going to be inhibited. Initial phase, you're going to have an increase in T4. So that's what we call as a CQ thyroid syndrome. CQ thyroid syndrome where T4 conversion to T3 is actually getting impaired. So it is automatically getting converted into increased reverse T3. So low T3 increase reverse T3 that can probably be seen in acute patients in the acute setting in the ICU also. And TSH can be highly variable, highly, highly variable in those patients. Correct. So it's a very simple question that you got, but we have discussed up and above that. So if you have discussed, if you have studied to that level, at least upper points to some level, this would be a very, very simple KQA question for you. So which of the following is involved in prognathism with long hands and feet? Again, um, very basic question. I invite your attention to this table, which I have discussed alongside with basics of endocrinology metabolism before starting off with hormones we discussed about the development of the anterior pituitary about the anatomy of the anterior pituitary the next is the, the issues with respect to the anterior pituitary physiology so in this anterior pituitary physiology you can see over here transcription factors i told you the most important transcription factor are pit1 followed by prop1 and i told you pit1 transcription factor, factor mutation is the most common cause for congenital hypopituitarism and i told you for everything it is pit1 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 and i told you the only exception are gonad Trophs. For gonadotrophs, it is not P1, it is actually SF1 and DAX1. And you can see SF1 and DAX1 are the other options here also. See, it's a clear pick, a clear pick, and we have discussed this table in total. I also told you other certain important points to keep in mind. The first cell to appear are corticotrophs, six weeks. Then I told you all the other hormones are secreted as such. The only, only difference is POMC. ACTH is not secreted as ACTH, it is secreted as POMC. From POMC, you have ACTH. You have MSH, you have enkephalins, and you have endorphins. Okay, beta enkephalins, and you have beta endorphins. Correct. Right. And then I have also told you about which are the glycoproteins, which are the polypeptides. FSH, TSH, LH are the glycoproteins. Are the glycoproteins. Correct. All of them are under stimulatory effect from the hypothalamus except for prolactin which is under inhibitory effect from the hypothalamus. That's why stock effect is such an important thing and that's why I told you dopamine levels. Dopamine is the in prolactin inhibitory hormone. Okay. Right. What are the stimulators for each hormone also we have discussed. What are the stimulators for ACTH? The most important stimulators for ACTH are corticotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus and vasopressin via which receptor? V3 receptor. What are the stimulators for somatotrop secreting growth hormone? I told you growth hormone releasing hormone and ghrelin. Very, very, very important again. Okay. What are the stimulators of prolactin, estrogen, TSH, sorry, estrogen, TRH, VIP and oxytocin. Estrogen, TRH, VIP, oxytocin is not there in this table. They are the stimulators. What are the stimulators for thyrotrops? Only one stimulator that is TRH. Again, all these things we have seen. So please go back and study this slide once more in detail. I think it would have been discussed by Krishna Kumar also because it is basic endocrine physiology that is being tested over here. And I think you should be able to get on with this very comfortably. Okay, so the question is, which of the following is involved in prognathism with long hands and feet? Which is basically to test out as to which is the transcription factor required for the growth of the somatotrophic cells, which is PIT and PROP, which PIT is the best answer, PIT is the answer over here, and that is PIT1. Correct. So endocrine six questions. Once again, we've got 100% strike rate in that, and that is what I'm trying to tell you. We are targeting 125 questions. I'm always targeting 125 out of 300, which I mean, what I actually think about when I do the videos is when somebody finishes of watching these videos, 
without doing any question bank without doing anything he should be able to target 125 if he does question bank also i think then it might even come to 5 or 10 questions extra so that was about endocrine for inict so from the world of respiratory system and endocrine we move to nephrology seven questions in nephrology this time let's start looking at the questions as the filtrate flows through the pct the concentration of all the following decreases except okay if you watch the physiology module and you don't answer this means again i have nothing to say this is again one of the most easiest questions amino acid and glucose are 100% absorbed at the level of the pct which is very clearly mentioned by sodium glucose cotransporter sodium glucose sdlt1 sdlt2 all these things we have mentioned we are even using sodium glucose transporter to inhibitors like anaglyphosin, dapaglyphosin, etc. STLT2 inhibitors. Amino acids are also 100% absorbed. Bicarbonate absorption, I told you, almost 85 to 90% absorbs absorption occurs in the level of the PCT. Chloride is also absorbed at the PCT itself. But in comparison, if you see in this question, chloride absorption is about 60-65%. Sodium absorption is also say 60-65%. So that's why the least out of it would be chloride, which I very clearly mentioned. Almost all the ions are maximally absorbed from the PCT, except magnesium, which is maximally absorbed from the thick acidic limbo blupofenly and inside the PCT we have graded and discussed inside that I've told you amino acids glucose are all full 100% bicarbonate is about 85 to 90% sodium chloride etc are 65 to 70% which means that so chloride is the one that is going to be least absorbed so the question is as the filtrate flows through the PCT concentration of all the following decreases except so concentration of everything is going to decrease but then chloride comparatively which be much better now I'm not going into the critical details of this question because I have told you along with hyponatremia that there is something called isoosmotic reabsorption occurring at the level of the PCT. That is why a normal person doesn't have something called hyponatremia. What is the meaning of isoosmotic reabsorption occurring at the level of the PCT? If you know this also, you can answer this question. Isoosmotic reabsorption occurring at the level of the PCT means that the filtrate that is coming into the PCT has got an osmolality of 290. The first place that is going into contact with is the PCT. The filter Filtrate coming out of the PCT also has 290 osmolality, which means that the osmolality doesn't change as you leave from the proximal tubule or in the proximal tubule absorption is isoosmotic. If it were absorbing more sodium and chloride, that means if it were absorbing more sodium and chloride, naturally it would absorb more water. Okay, so water in comparison to that sodium, we would all have died of hyponatremia. Okay, so that doesn't happen. What are the protective mechanisms in the body that prevent hyponatremia is the question. The first answer to that is isosmotic reabsorption occurring at the level of the PCT. Because of this isosmotic reabsorption, the osmolality doesn't change, which means that chloride, although if it is getting absorbed here, we are still not having an osmotic disequilibrium, which means that it should not be 100% absorbed. Correct. If you think with that common sense also, you'll be able to answer this question. Otherwise, if you study by facts and numbers also, amino acid glucose full absorption, bicarbonate almost 90% absorption. In comparison to that, this is much less. Okay, so that's it. So we go to question number two. Question number two makes me actually feel very bad for two reasons. One reason I have so shown this cigar as a nomogram during my ABJ discussion, but I did not explain what is A, B, C, D, E, and F. So that's one thing which makes me feel bad. Second thing which makes me feel bad is that INACT asked this question. In spite of this being an outdated method to look for ABG, this is being done by sisters, paramedical staff, etc., who don't know how to interpret an ABG. This will help them. That's it. Nothing more. So this is basically for sisters and other paramedical staff, but I'll just show you what it's being done over here. It's very, very simple actually. Arterial pH is on the x-axis. You are having bicarbonate on the y-axis this side and then you are having PCO2 over here. This is the basic thing. The question that they have asked for your exam is to identify this point A and also identify this point D. Identify this point A, identify this point D. Now let us see what this actually stands for. Point A is actually looking at a pH of 7.1. So pH equal to 7.1. So what does pH 7.1 mean? That this patient is having acidosis. pH 7.1 is acidosis. In this patient, what is the bicarbonate like? Bicarbonate, if you draw a line from here, is almost like 24. So bicarbonate is almost like normal. So bicarbonate arbitrarily fixed values, normal. So it's 24. Then you are having a PCO2. PCO2, if you look over here, you see it's very, very high. So PCO2 is almost like say 80. PCO2 is 80, which means that this patient is having severe respiratory acidosis. Severe respiratory acidosis. I told you. Primary change is acidosis, which has gone along the lines of acidosis. PCO2 increases acidosis, bicarbonate increases alkalosis. So here bicarbonate has actually remained the same. PCO2 is the prime component. So it's a respiratory component. So it's a severe respiratory acidosis. In this graph, we assume that acute changes are not compensated. Chronic changes are compensated. So you can even call this as acute respiratory acidosis. There is no compensation. Bicarb is not even changed 1%. So this is acute respiratory acidosis. So respiratory acidosis, respiratory acidosis. So three answers can be correct. We are ruling out option number two. Correct. 
Now they have asked for what is D. This is also very simple. In D, you can see that the pH is 7.6. So pH is equal to 7.6, which means that that is definitely an alkalosis over here. You look at the bicarb values. The bicarb values are almost in the range of 16. So bicarb is actually decreased, which means that it has gone along the lines of acidosis. PCO2 on the other hand, if you look over here, is almost like 25. PCO2 is 25. So what does that mean? PCO2 has decreased, bicarb has also decreased. So who has moved along the lines of alkalosis? It is PCO2 who has moved along the lines of alkalosis. So this is a case of a respiratory alkalosis. So this is a case of a respiratory alkalosis. In a respiratory alkalosis, is it compensated or not? Is it compensated or not? Compensated respiratory alkalosis means what should be the compensation? It should be metabolic acidosis. That is the compensation. In a chronic respiratory alkalosis, as you know the rule, for every 10 millimeter of mercury, decrease in PCO2 okay bicarb should fall by 4 milliequivalents per liter this is the rule correct here how much has it fallen is it supposed to say 25 25 means 20 to 25 that's what we are actually seeing so almost 20 to 25 it has fallen by so 40 is the normal value so the fall is almost by 20 so when the fall is by 20 for 10 it has to decrease by 4 for 20 it has to approximately decrease by 8 so here it should decrease by 8. What is the normal value of bicarb? It is 24. If it decreases by 8, how much bicarb will you get? You get 16. So which means that here it has fallen by almost the ideal amount. Which means that this is a compensated respiratory alkalosis. So what is a compensated respiratory alkalosis? It is a respiratory alkalosis with metabolic acidosis. So this is a compensated respiratory alkalosis or a respiratory alkalosis with the metabolic acidosis. Okay, more than from this graph, from the ABG, it's much much more easier. Hope you understood the concept. The concept is that you are identifying a point, looking at the pH, looking at the PCO2, looking at the bicarb. Now, if you look at this pH, the pH is 7.6, which means that we are having an alkaline pH. Alkalosis is definitely the primary problem. Now, to identify the primary problem, you see whether PCO2 or bicarb, which is moved along the lines of the primary problem. Here, PCO2 has actually decreased, which is definitely moving along the lines of the primary problem because it is alkalosis. Bicarbonate has also decreased, which is moving away from the primary problem, that is acidosis. So, bicarbonate decreases acidosis, the primary problem is alkalosis, so they don't allow each other. So, the primary issue here is undoubtedly, it is respiratory, it is respiratory alkalosis. Now, in a respiratory alkalosis, whether it is compensated or not compensated. If it is compensated, what is the compensation for respiratory alkalosis? For a fall in bicarb, the compensation is fall in PCO2. For a fall in PCO2, the compensation is fall in bicarb. So, here it is a fall in PCO2, the compensation has to be a fall in bicarb. So, for a chronic respiratory alkalosis, what should be the compensation? For every 10 millimeters of mercury fall, the fall in bicarb should be by 4. Here, supposedly, it has fallen by around 10 to 20. So, the fall should be by around 4 to 8. So 24 is normal by car value. Here it should be 24 minus 8, which is approximately 16. That is what you see over here, which means that it is compensated. So it's a compensated respiratory alkalosis with a metabolic acidosis. So the first one is a respiratory acidosis, which is no way compensated. Second one is a respiratory alkalosis with a metabolic acidosis. Okay, like that you can identify any of these points. You don't have to mug it up. You can actually identify any of these points. For the original exam question, I don't know whether they gave you the right numbers, etc. If they've given you the numbers, with a bit of common sense, you can answer. But this is a question that I've not discussed. Okay, we go to question number three. Question number three is something which, again, very, very, very easily you can answer. There's nothing about this question. Filterability is what they have checked for. Okay, so A has got maximum filterability. C has got least filterability. Now that itself makes the question very, very clear. All through the glomerular basin membrane, you have very strong negative charge. All through the glomerular basin membrane, you have very strong negative charge. So anions are going to be just like that, just like that repelled. A has maximum filterability means A has to be cationic. And of course, B has to be neutral and C has to be anionic because that is repelled. So negatively charged things are being repelled. We have three layers of the glomerular filtration barrier. You have the endothelial layer. The endothelial layer actually contains podocalyxin, which is very, very important to repel these negatively charged molecules. You have the glomerular basin membrane, which contains the heparin sulfate, proteoglycans like perlican, agrin, etc., which are also very important in repelling. Then you have the epithelial layer, which also contains podocalyxin, which helps in repelling. It is not the epithelial layer to be specific, it is slit diaphragm. 
it is across the slit diaphragm that you are having filtration happening. So it's endothelium, GBM, slit diaphragm, across which filtration happens. Each one has a very important potent tool with it to repel off negatively charged molecules. At the level of the endothelium, it is podocalyxin. Slit diaphragm also it is podocalyxin. At the level of the GBM, it is the heparin sulfate proteoglycans, perlecan and agarin. Filtration barrier has been discussed in great detail. With that minimal knowledge, you can actually answer this question. Okay, so sorry for missing out on cigar and nomogram. This one is obviously a clean pick. Macular densa formed by which part of the nephron? Now, this uh, again is there is a lot of confusion with respect to this, but in this question, there is no doubt distal tubule is the answer. Some people say distal convoluted tubule was there in the options. In that case, you mark that, but that's wrong uh, because sorry, that is actually wrong. But for the particular exam, because everything else is like unrelated options, you can even take it. I told you very, very clearly thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. Okay, thick ascending limb of loop of Henle is otherwise called distal straight tubule okay distal straight tubule plus distal convoluted tubule okay plus distal convoluted tubule is together called distal tubule okay you can actually see this i've discussed thousand times in physiology of kidney video thick ascending limb of loop of henley plus distal convoluted tubule is called distal tubule thick ascending limb of loop of henley has a modified tall columnar cells in the cortical part modified tall columnar cells in the cortical part of the thick ascending limb of loop of henle is called macular densa is called macular densa so actually speaking macular densa is a part of what it is thick ascending limb of loop of henle or distal straight tubule if it is not there in the options you write distal tubule nothing is there you write dct but actually it is not dct okay so i think it was distal tubule so in that case that's perfect what is the function of macular densa tubular glomerular feedback mechanism and i think in the video krishna kumar has once more discussed tubular glomerular feedback mechanism in this inc recall video i have also discussed tubular glomerular feedback mechanism you can watch as per your convenience so this is a very straight big question no doubt on that membranous nephropathy associated with some people feel it is membrane or proliferated that was asked i'm not clear membranous nephropathy associated with when you think of membranous nephropathy itself the first thing that comes to your mind is drugs there you have gold, you have D-pencilamine, you have captopril, you have mercury, then you have NSAIDs. That's the first thing I told you. Then colorectal malignancies. Most, most important association is malignancy. Then under autoimmune, I told you very, very important. SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune thyroid illness. Okay, I told you. So SLE is there in that. Under infections, I told you, most important is hepatitis B. Most, most, most important is hepatitis B. Rarely, I told you, HIV, hepatitis C. HIV is all about collapsing glomerulopathy. It can also be seen sometimes with IgA nephropathy, very rarely with membranous. So, those are the three options. So, I think it is A, B and D. C is actually being marked in many of the guides and many of the books and many of the people have actually given the explanations. That is absolutely wrong. It is A, B, D. CLL is associated with membrane proliferated. Solid tumors, membranous, plasma cell disorders and hematological malignancies is membrane proliferated. So CLL is wrong. HIV, SLE, hepatitis B correct. Hepatitis B and SLE best answers. HIV also acceptable answer. CLL no. Okay. Can again go back and see this we've discussed in great detail hematological malignancies plasma cell dyscrasias cryoglobal anemia all these things come under mpgn and not membranes okay so straight pick from what we have actually taught what i have discussed in class so high anion gap acidosis with low bicarbonate level is seen in all the following except okay such a simple question so what is anion gap anion gap is equal to sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate correct or I would say sodium is the only measured cation, others are the unmeasured cation, is equal to chloride plus bicarbonate plus the unmeasured anion. Am I right? So sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate is equal to unmeasured anion minus unmeasured cation is equal to my anion gap. Okay, fine. So when I am saying bicarbonate falls is always equal to acidosis bicarbonate falling is always equal to acidosis if the fall is compensated by by increase in chloride levels the fall is compensated by increase in chloride levels then my anion gap remains the same okay anion gap remains the same okay this is basically what is called normal anion gap metabolic acidosis normal anion gap metabolic acidosis if 
not compensated by chloride okay not compensated by chloride then it is called high anion gap metabolic acidosis so then it is called high anion gap metabolic acidosis which means that unmeasured anions have actually increased correct which means that unmeasured anions have actually increased okay very basic terms so let me see from where all you can get this high anion gap endogenous acid can increase or your exogenous acid can increase correct endogenous acid can be lactic acid uremia related uremic acidosis or endogenous keto acid formation in the body because of either diabetes or starvation okay exogenous acid can be alcohol that is methanol or ethylene glycol it can be salicylate it can be paraldehyde me coming and writing kusmal code and saying case for this use for this that's not nice man i am a dm nephrology person i should show my standard so that is why you can see even through the videos also you have not seen so many codes and i have not actually gone for i don't study that way also i believe in straightforward linear learning and always that the perpendicular distance is the shortest distance so you just be very clear with that you study as much as you can and as rohan very rightly pointed out at the end of the video two things which i felt are very very important first is be more concerned about things which are under your control and don't be too much bothered about things which are outside your control okay that is one thing and the second thing of course is that you you plan out in such a way that you are not having too many long term long term goals okay just have very short goal these two days what you can do and don't be so worried if your plan doesn't work also because need not necessarily have a plan each person can bat in his own way okay you have seen insamam ul haq i think insamam ul haq is a legendary pakistan batsman he has scored tons and tons of runs have you seen his physique he looks very obese he is very lazy he doesn't actually run on the field but in spite of all this he is a legendary batsman Virendra Sehwag has no technique, nothing. He just stands where he is and he just blasts the ball. Still, the ball goes to the boundary. Rahul Dravid, the technical perfection, will caress the ball to the offside. Still, you get only four runs. You don't get anything more. Okay, so it's that your technique has to be fitting, and you have to score the boundary. That's the only thing that matters. Even if you study it as a small chord, or if you write like this, it is okay. But me being a technically qualified person, it's tough for me to write the other way around. Okay, so. This is about high anion gap acidosis. So DK is there, lactic acidosis is there, salicylate is there. Renal disorders can actually produce both. Renal acidification defects produce normal anion gap acidosis. Uremia basically produces high anion gap acidosis. So under normal anion gap acidosis, we have two causes. One are renal acidification defects. Okay, renal acidification defects, which are basically what we call renal tubular acidosis. Then you have gastrointestinal loss of bicarb. GI loss of bicarb. This can be due to a diarrhea. We can also see it in urethrosigmoidostomy. See, urethrosigmoidostomy, or with the use of anion exchange resins. Okay, anion exchange resins. So these are the causes for normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. So here, of course, the answer would be a renal disorder. how to differentiate between them based on urine anion gap etc i have discussed in my abg videos i think this much knowledge will be more than fine if you can watch the abg videos you'll have perfect crystal clear understanding i think that point you would be actually feeling very confident to answer anything with respect to abg although i again apologize for not teaching you sigar and listen nomogram so that is about it so those questions everything we have answered the only question that we missed out here is the nomogram in case we have not studied that this is a question which i have not taught you this is a pediatric question and again um, i think this is a slightly tougher question again very debatable two year old child with nephrotic syndrome what is true about the vaccines that can be given before commencing treatment vaccination as per schedule of course you have to vaccinate the child as per schedule give pneumococcal vaccine before starting steroid it's an optional thing but it's welcome it's not that you cannot give pneumococcal vaccine before starting steroid you can definitely give I think singara will be discussing this in detail only killed vaccines can be given while on steroid yes while on steroid better not give live attenuated vaccines and general recommendation is not to give opv vaccine not given to siblings this is the debatable thing but as per the recent guidelines there are a lot of reasons being actually postulated especially with relation to vaccine associated to poliomyelitis as well as with respect to excreting the virus in stool and then in a crowded surrounding the sibling also getting this so opv vaccine not given to siblings is a very debatable thing but for your exam i think you can probably take it as right so all the four statements are right although this is a very easy question with respect to 1 2 and 4 statements but i think this third statement 
OPV not given to siblings is slightly tricky one. I have consulted so many pediatricians and they also feel that that is how it is. So I'm not a what is authoritative person to talk on this, but OPV not given to siblings is also right. So in fact, the D option here is A, B, C, D. All the four are correct. In fact, all the four statements are right. So out of the seven nephrology questions, five questions very easy. Nomogram is a slightly tough question. This is also one option is slightly tricky. But I think apart from that, it's a very smooth sailing passage. Correct. So from respiratory, endocrine and nephro, we go to subject number four. And subject number four is rheumatology. Let us look into the five questions asked in rheumatology. Very simple, straightforward questions. I write is a scene in all except if you don't answer this, I'll get very, very angry because I told this, told this, told this again and again that rheumatoid arthritis, there is no iritis, there is uveitis absent in rheumatoid arthritis. It is all about scleritis, episcleritis and conjunctivitis. You just mark the answer, rheumatoid arthritis. Don't ask me anything more. Nothing else is required. Bechet, most common of the manifestation I told you, acute anti I told you, Bechet patient, don't miss out on this. Ulcerative colitis is linked to seronegative arthropathy. In seronegative arthropathy, the most common extra articular manifestation itself is acute anterior uveitis. SLE causing uveitis is not common, but again, that's, it's not that you can't see. But in rheumatoid arthritis, I made this statement, I made this statement thousand times that it is not seen. So that's why this is a very straightforward answer. Rheumatology, you should be scoring full marks for the, for the zeal with which I have actually discussed rheumatology because I, I like rheumatology as a science so much. 40-year-old male with gradually progressive stiffening of the spine. MRI image is actually being shown over here. I think everything about this disease, including squaring of vertebra, I mean, dagger sign, anterior anti interspinous ligament calcification, trolley track sign, plus your bamboo spine, square wave vertebra, everything we have discussed, shiny corner sign, Romano sign, ankylosing spondylitis is the obvious answer here. So, oriatic arthritis, I just told you one single point, it involves a C-spine mode, that itself means this is out. Rheumatoid arthritis, I told you, again, atlanta subluxation, nothing. So, fluorosis in this setting, absolutely not possible. So, you don't have to discuss anything more. Very simple, straightforward answer this. The white arrows, which are, which is your dagger sign, calcified into spinous ligament, then your calcified apophysal joint capsules lateral to the interspinous ligament, that is your tolly tract sign, both which I have actually discussed. So if possible, please go back and see seronegative arthropathies, okay? Seronegative arthropathies are very, very, very important. So this was question number two from rheumatology. We go to question number three from rheumatology, which is a slightly tricky question. So 25-year-old female developing cyanosis of digits when hands put in cold water, fold or bed. So pallor, cyanosis, redness and rebounding, it's a Raynaud's. So 25-year-old female developing Raynaud's can be of two types. One, it can be a primary Raynaud, okay? It's a primary Raynaud, which is generally seen in young females with a positive family history where there is no critical limb ischemia, okay? There is no critical limb ischemia. Second, it could be a secondary Raynaud, secondary Raynaud, which is associated with connective tissue disease where you get critical limb ischemia. So, where you get critical limb ischemia. So, both are possible in this girl, but we don't have any evidence for critical limb ischemia. We don't have any evidence for primary, secondary. They've not mentioned anything like that. Scleroderma, obviously, is when you think of Raynaud itself, what will come to your mind? Scleroderma comes to your mind, of which there is diffuse and limited. I told you limited is the one which is a long-standing um, Raynaud, which is very severe and more severe, obviously, in limited. So, here it's not being mentioned. So, scleroderma is definitely right. Cryoglobulinemia, if you go back and see the different presentations of cryoglobulinemia, important things under cryo, one very, very important thing is obviously Raynaud. So, ANC are always correct. Hyperthyroidism has got nothing to do with Raynaud. We discussed out and out about hyperthyroidism has got nothing to do with Raynaud. Migraine, um, I have not discussed with Raynaud. But migraine patients can have Raynaud-like symptoms. Is something which you can see in so many books. It's been actually described. We can see patients coming with Raynaud-like symptoms. So, probably, there is nothing called ANC here. So, probably ABC correct is the one. Although, migraine and Raynaud are not directly, directly correlated, but many times when you give sumatriptan, etc., there can be worsening of Raynaud-like symptoms because of vasoconstriction, etc., etc. There are so many etiologies to that, but I think that can also be partly taken as correct. So, even if you don't know migraine, I think still you should be able to get this question correct. Okay, hyperthyroidism and Raynaud, nothing. So, if you wanted to see detail about Raynaud, go back and see this Clearodroma video. Which of the following is correct about drugs used in gout? Gout treatment we've discussed in great detail. Now, Aspirin and gout. I told you there is no role. When you talk about gout, it is colchicine or it is NSAID. Okay, colchicine or NSAID. This is my slide on gout. I've seen colchicine. When diagnosis is in doubt, you give colchicine. And if it is gout, it will respond to colchicine. If you can't or if you see if the diagnosis is well established, then NSAID is the drug of choice. Patient is not intolerant or not tolerating NSAIDs or colchicine, then you can give intraarticular steroid or single intramuscular ACTH. 
we can even give interleukin 1 beta antagonist like anakinra kanakinumab ritonacept etc are the other points now let's go back to the question aspirin is not used aspirin is not used it's 100% correct because aspirin decreases the excretion of uric acid it has no value which i have very clearly mentioned so this is a right statement and aspirin is used is obviously a wrong statement indomethacin is used and i didn't mention the mechanism of action because it is multiple pathways it's a complex mechanism but still obviously is a drug of choice diclofenac is an nsaid that's also powerful it acts by concentrating in the joint which i have not mentioned but that's again like a part of your nsaid use so it's like a drug of choice so established code we always go for nsaid diclofenac concentrates in the joint that's also a right statement so a b and c are the right statements if you watch the video i think it's a very simple question only thing that i have not mentioned is diclofenac concentrates in the joint so pharmacology point but there are so many mechanisms explained for so many of the nsaid so even if you get any of the mechanisms that you don't know it's better that you mark it as right and aspirin has absolutely no role in the treatment of acute gout again Pretty simple question. So I think this one also, I think most of you would have got it, right? There is nothing much confusing in this. We go to the last question in rheumatology. And the last question in rheumatology is, a woman with morning stiffness which gradually resolves over one hour, which is correct about treatments. You're asking about the treatment of RA, which we've discussed in great detail. Treatment of RA, I've told you three patients also. One patient who is not having much signs, second a patient having proper signs, and third is a patient who has crossed two years. So cross two years, nothing. Patient having proper signs, give steroid, bridge and then start DMARDs. Other patient automatically start DMARDs. NSAIDs have basically no role except for symptomatic relief. So NSAIDs improve symptoms means in the sense that it's like slightly relief, but having disease modifying activity, absolutely not. NSAIDs have disease modifying activity only in two conditions, that is angulosic spondylitis and Reiter syndrome, which I have very clearly mentioned. Now, raise the ESR and CRP. ESR, CRP, CCP, RA. Four things we do. CCP and RA will actually tell us about the prognosis in the beginning. Repeatedly doing has absolutely no value. ESR and CRP, we keep on checking, keep on checking, keep on checking. They are the most important tools and relapses and in fact diagnosed on the basis of ESR and CRP. So, this is absolutely, absolutely correct. Okay. So, A and C, there is absolutely no doubt. So, you have either ABC or you have ACD. Anyway, A and C are properly correct. Absence of erosion on X-ray rules out diagnosis. No. Absence of erosion on X-ray is basically not very common because you can get erosions on X-ray. But in a patient who is having very early rheumatoid arthritis, you think of the patient whom you want to salvage Vera within the first three months. How is he or how is she going to have erosions? She's not going to have erosions. Because she's not going to have erosions, do we say that you're not having rheumatoid arthritis? Absolutely no. So erosions are part and parcel of the disease. You can get it especially as the disease progresses. But absence of erosion rules out the diagnosis is wrong. You cannot actually rule out just because erosions are not there, which means that this statement, this statement, this statement is all wrong. So we are coming back to the last statement should be the answer. So let's see, HLA-DR4 is related to prognosis. The statement per se is not correct. HLA-DR4 is part and parcel of rheumatoid arthritis, but does it actually tell you that the prognosis is bad? Nowhere I could find literature like this. But in this question, that is the only possible answer. But HLA-DR4 relating to prognosis, I searched rigorously for, for this particular statement. HLA-DR4 uh, is present in many, many patients, just like we say HLA-B27 in Reiter's disease is bad prognosis. But HLA-DR4 in rheumatoid arthritis is not basically linked to any prognosis per se. But in this question, probably you have to take it as right. Either INAC people were wrong or our interpretation of the question was wrong something like that so rheumatology is also basically a cakewalk nothing much over here it's a very simple exercise i think endocrine rheumatology nephrology and respiratory system we have discussed all the four have been very easy and we are i think almost close to 100 percent strike rate and that is the only thing that i can do we go to gi system here we have only two questions very simple two questions let us see those two questions here patient presented with massive Ascites. It is an ascites based question. Ascites has been discussed in length, breadth and actually in most detail because ascites is one of my personal favorite topics in GI and everything in GI is actually very close to me. So ascites is this question. Let's see. There is nothing called uh, what is your translated x-ray these days. We have only something called SAG here. So SAG is equal to your serum albumin minus ascitic fluid albumin. So serum albumin minus acidic fluid albumin came to have a serum protein 3 and acidic protein 3, 1. So that itself is actually not correct because you need albumin values. I don't know what they what they meant by that. Anyway, I'm taking this to be albumin and giving it as 3 minus 1. That is 2 gram per deciliter. So SAG more than 1.1, more than or equal to 1.1 is equal to portal hypertension. So this is a case of portal hypertension. Less than 1.1, I would actually take it as peritoneal causes. So I don't know whether albumin was given, but anyway, in the question that I got is basically nothing to do with albumin. So I am assuming protein to be albumin and taking it this way. Portal hypertension can have high sag, high protein ascites, or can be a high sag, low protein ascites. High sag, low protein ascites. Correct. 
high sac high protein ascites where do you get you get it in Bacchiari syndrome high sac low protein ascites where do you get you get it in cirrhosis I told you this very very clearly sinusoidal fenestrations what actually goes through the sinusoidal fenestrations and the fact that you are having low albumin all these things we have actually seen I don't know whether I have to waste my time on this see sag is equal to serum albumin minus ascitic fluid albumin correct serum albumin minus ascitic fluid albumin correct for SAG to increase, either serum albumin should increase or acidic fluid albumin should decrease. Okay. For SAG to increase, either serum albumin should increase or acidic fluid albumin should decrease. Serum albumin increasing is not practical. Serum albumin increasing is not practical. Which means that acidic fluid albumin should decrease. Correct. Acidic fluid albumin should decrease. Fine. So when acidic fluid albumin decreases, okay, you are having something called high SAG ascites. So in both these conditions, acidic fluid albumin is decreasing. Correct. Because albumin is not going out here from the hepatic vein or here from the sinusoid. In either case, it is not going. But in Bacchiari syndrome, it is basically a translation that is happening across the hepatic vein. Because it is a translation that is happening across the hepatic vein, your proteins are going to leak, especially the small molecular weight proteins. Because they are going to leak, the proteins are actually going to be high. That is why it is high protein ascites. Here because it is full fibrous and the sinusoids are defenestrated, no proteins are going to leak. So basically it is going to be a low protein ascites. Hope I am very clear. High SAG is because of low albumin. Okay, low albumin. Albumin will not leak across the hepatic vein, will not leak across the sinusoid. So it's always going to be high SAG. Now why low protein? Because low molecular weight proteins because of endothelial defenestrations cannot leak out in cirrhosis. Low molecular weight proteins because it is a translative leak from the hepatic vein will leak out in Bacchieri syndrome. That is why in Bacchieri syndrome the proteins in the acidic fluid are high whereas here the proteins in acidic fluid are low. Correct. So high sac high protein ascites is in Bacchieri syndrome. High sac low protein ascites is seen in cirrhosis. So what should be the answer for this? Acidic fluid protein is low. 1 gram per deciliter. Less than 2.5 itself is low. So this is a case of high sac. This is a case of a high sac low protein ascites. Where do you get high sac low protein ascites? You get it in cirrhosis. Correct. You get high sac low protein ascites where you get it in cirrhosis. So can you see cirrhosis in the option? Congestive cardiac failure, no. Bacchieri syndrome, no. TB, no. Bacchieri syndrome, I have told you, at the end can progress to cirrhosis. Very rarely, Bacchieri syndrome is mostly subacute, but sometimes can become chronic and become cirrhosis. So when Bacchieri becomes cirrhosis, this can be a probable answer. Okay, this is a very tricky question. But again, if you watch the video on ascites, 100% you will answer this. 100% you will answer this. Because you getting a question on ascites, etc. wrong, is something that makes me feel very bad. Okay, so once again, ascites is divided into high sag and low sag correct high sag means it is more than or equal to 1.1 that means serum albumin minus acetic fluid albumin is more than or equal to 1.1 how can it be increased that is only because acetic fluid albumin decreases why acetic fluid albumin decreases albumin has a pretty big 69000 molecular weight it cannot actually pass through so that is decreasing in the acetic fluid now this is divided into high sag high protein High sac high protein means why there is protein high because low molecular weight proteins are escaping across the hepatic vein. So that is why proteins are high. Proteins escaping across the hepatic vein which is that condition where you have translative leak across the hepatic vein that is Bacchieri syndrome. Now in high sac low protein, high sac low protein there is no leak because there is defenestration on the sinusoid. That is actually seen where in cirrhosis. Okay. So, Bacchieri is high sac high protein, cirrhosis high sac low protein. So, any cause of cirrhosis can be the answer. And here the only possible answer is late Bacchieri, which can go into cirrhosis. Okay. Now, second question. 40 year old female with abdominal pain distension, vitals are stable. Again, per abdomen shows presence of dullness in the flanks. This is a case of again ascites. Minimum amount of fluid should be 1500 ml to show shifting dullness. I've told this very clearly in the video. You can actually see this. 500, 1500. 500 is for shifting dullness. 1500 is for fluid thrill. 100 ml is for ultrasound. Okay. 100 ml is for ultrasound. So this statement is wrong. Minimum amount of fluid should be 500 ml to show shifting dullness in the flanks. That is correct. USC can detect a minimum of less than 100 ml. That is also correct. Most common cause of ascites is high sac ascites, high sac low protein ascites, that is cirrhosis. Okay. High sac low protein ascites, that is cirrhosis. Those three statements are correct. So this one is correct. This one is correct. This one is correct.
and neck veins always look for constrictive pericarditis constrictive pericarditis left to lower quadrant 3 cm cephal and 2 cm medial i told you this is the most preferred site for ascitic tapping although we tap anywhere we want if dash is absent chance of ascitis is less than 10% that's what i'm saying portal hypertension is absent chance of ascitis is less than 10% which means that if you look at ascitis high sag ascitis comes to 90% low sag ascitis comes to only 10% High sag ascites 90% is because of portal hypertension. That is divided into high sag high protein ascites that is due to Bacchieri syndrome. High sag low protein ascites that is due to cirrhosis. Okay. Low sag ascites 10% is again divided into low sag low protein ascites. Where do you see low sag low protein ascites? You see low sag low protein ascites in nephrotic syndrome. Where do you see low sag high protein ascites? And there is so much of leak across the peritoneal capillary that is seen in peritoneal causes like a peritoneal carcinomatosis or a TB or something like that. A lot of albumin just like that leaks. Correct. So just from that ascites module, we have two questions. If you watch that, both questions are going to be very easy for you. Okay. So with that, we come to the end of gastro. Unfortunately, nothing was asked from hepatology, only questions on gastro. So now we move to the next of the modules. So we are almost halfway through. We've discussed respiratory, endocrine, nephro, rheumatology, gastro, five chapters done. Now we're going to the sixth of the chapters, that is cardiology, with six questions this time. Let's see the first of the questions. Palpitation, pulse 180, BP 70, 50, ECG shows narrow querous complex tachycardia with regular heart rate. What is the next step in management? Such a, such a simple question. Any narrow querous complex tachycardia or any tachyarrhythmia where the patient is chemodynamically compromised can be managed only one way, and that is DC synchronized cardioversion. That everybody knows. It's a very simple question. If you don't know anything, you can actually answer this. There is nothing much to be bothered about. Just let me show you a similar ECG to discuss this called concept. Now, I told you on an ECG, the most important thing that you look for, first off, is your QRS complex because that is the one that is due to ventricular depolarization. You should know that whether it is normal or it is a broad-based complex to see the site of origin. So, here you are having a normal or a narrow QRS complex. So, this is a narrow QRS complex. When you are having a narrow QRS complex, what does it mean? It means that the rhythm has definitely originated from above the ventricles because if it is from the ventricle, you are going to have a wide QRS complex. So this is a narrow QRS complex. If you look at the rate of this, it is almost like coming to 10, so almost like 150 per minute. So 150 per minute is the rate you are having a narrow QRS complex tachycardia. So it's more than 150, it is a tachycardia. Now, is this QRS complex due to a preceding P wave? That is the next most important thing. That means to know whether this is due to an atrial activation. That's the most important part. Now, when you look into this, this is a QRST, 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 QRST. You are not seeing any kind of a P wave here. No P wave, nothing. So if you want to have a doubt, I told you, whenever you have a doubt, you identify the T wave in P1, in V1, and then you draw the line, you draw the line, you draw the line, everywhere you're going to meet the T wave. So this is full T wave, there is no P wave here, which means that this impulse is not originated from the atria, this impulse is not originated from the sinus node, which means from where else can this impulse originate? This impulse can originate from the junction, that is one possibility, or it may be a re-entry tachycardia. So this impulse can originate from the junction, or it could be a re-entry tachycardia. Junctional impulses, so that's one possibility you have. This could be a junctional tachycardia or it could be a re-entry tachycardia which could be an AVNRT which is much much more common or it could be an AVRT. AVNRT is an AV nodal re-entry tachycardia, AVRT is atrial ventricular re-entry tachycardia. Junctional tachycardias are generally speaking very rare and rates are generally on the lower sides like 120, 130 etc. To be more than 150 etc. Very, very, very unlikely. Among these three, the most likely one, there are small, small ways you can actually differentiate between this, but we are not going to the fine details now. It's more likely to be AVNRT. Without any structural heart disease, somebody presenting like this is very likely to be an AVNRT. AVRT more or less occurs in the context of Wolf Parkinson White's disease. And in AVRT, somewhere you should be able to pick up the P wave. Here you are not able to see the P wave. P wave should lie definitely outside the QRS complex here nowhere nothing to be seen when p wave is not seen it is avnrt 100% because it is in subcumscribed inside the qrs complex only other possibility is a junctional tachycardia but that is very rare so suppose we had an irregular rhythm okay suppose we had an irregular rhythm with identifiable p waves then the whole context would have been completely different so irregular rhythm with identifiable p waves means we would have thought of probably a multifocal atrial tachycardia with no p waves means and fibrillatory waves we would have thought of atrial fibrillation that's a different thing altogether here we are talking of a narrow qrs complex tachycardia that is regular with no identifiable p waves which means that we are coming down to only these things of which the most common answer would be an avnrt 
Okay, so this is an AVNRT, which obviously is managed with a synchronized DC cardio version. Suppose the patient is hemodynamically unstable, and if stable, of course, we give adenosine 6, then again give 12, then again give 12. If not responding, we try verapamil and stuff, which we've been discussing in detail. So this is a very simple, straightforward question. I think if you just see in the video, in a glimpse, you'll be able to answer this. Question number two, 40 year old presence. This I think Rohan has discussed this question beautifully. This is a question where a patient is coming to you with an acute abdomen. And when a patient comes to you with an acute abdomen, necessarily, I mean, um, not necessarily the patient has to have guarding, rigidity, etc., especially the older people. So that's again not 100%. Then this patient has absent bowel sounds. So that's fine. This patient has a BP of 90 50, pulse rate of 180 per minute, almost going into hemodynamic compromise. Uh, could this be a severe acute pancreatitis? Definitely not. Doesn't look like pancreatitis by any means. Does it look like a perforated ulcer? Yes, this could be a perforated ulcer, but they've not given any clue, like air under the diaphragm. There's no clue like that. Aneurysm rupture can also present like this, but there's no pulsatile mass per abdomen. But still, I would entertain aneurysm rupture in this patient. It is possible. It's possible, definitely possible. But because you have been clearly mentioned that it is irregular, irregular rhythms. Past medical history of CAD, some people say it was there in the question. Some people believe that it was not there in the question. So I'm not sure if CAD is also there, irregularly irregular rhythm. Very easy answer because the most common cause of mesenteric ischemia is also an embolic one. So this is very much like that. Aortic aneurysm rupture can also present this way. But I personally feel that this is more likely in favor of mesenteric ischemia because they've given clues for you to pick up. Because they've given clues for you to pick up yourself, that's more likely to be the answer. So we go to question number three in cardiology, sequence after the P wave. I think many of many of the students, I feel so upset that they got it wrong. This is actually my own slide from what we have discussed. All through my discussion on JVP, I had this on top. Once you had actually glimpsed, had a glimpse of this, I think you would have not got it wrong. It's such a simple question. See, uh, we just go back and see the sequence here. I told you, we always start talking with atrial contraction. So we always start off with atrial contraction. Then we go to isovolumetric contraction, rapid ejection, reduced ejection. These are the three parts of systole I have told you so many times. So S1 and S2 will be asked on either side of this. Then we have protodiastole, isovolumetric relaxation, rapid filling, reduced filling. So these are the phases in diastole, which you know. And atrial contraction also happens to be in diastole. You know that atrial contraction is required for rejecting the remaining 30% of the blood, after which you will have S1, that is when the AV valves close. Okay, then AV valve will, con so then ventricle will start contracting, first as a closed chamber, then it will open up the semilunar valve, rapid ejection, reduced ejection. So what is the doubt here, man? So you see A wave, A wave is the first thing. So A wave is the first thing. Soon after A wave, you have the first start sound. So soon after A wave, you are having the first start sound. So after A, automatically it should be B. Correct. Then comes rapid filling. See, rapid filling occurs see, much, much, much later. You see, rapid filling occurs much later. That is after S2, protodiastole, isovolumetric relaxation. After everything that we are actually having the rapid filling. So, rapid filling is occurring much, much later. Whereas I told you V wave is the only wave that is seen with systole as well as in diastole. Even before the end of S2, you are having the V wave originating and then you are having the V wave coming down, which I have told you so many times. And T wave is due to ventricular depolarization followed by repolarization, which also occurs inside the systole itself. It occurs inside the systole itself. So it's only after the T wave that the systole itself is completed. So then rapid filling, reduced filling are actually way, way after that because they are actually in diastole. Store. So, which means that A wave, S1, rapid filling, and then you are having the T, sorry, A wave, S1, having the T wave, and then you are having the rapid filling. T wave, you are having the rapid filling. Correct. So, it was A, B, D, C in this particular question. Okay, just have to know that there are three phases in systole, there are three phases in diastole. You need to know that the JVP has a C wave, sorry, A wave, then has an X descent, then have the V wave and then the Y wave. The V wave actually starts somewhere over here. Because then again, the ventricle, the atria are starting to get filled. And then you are having the QRS complex and the T wave inside the stool. It was a very, very simple question, but unfortunately, many people got it wrong. If you have just listened to the physiology videos in the beginning of our cardiology or seen the JVP videos, it would have been a very easy question. Now we go to the next one. Patient present with complaints of chest pain, best investigation is I think basic maybe to see to it that people have some happiness in between because the question is very, very easy. I don't want to discuss and waste time. Trop T, Trop I or now even HS Trop I we use. They are the best. Okay. So there is no doubt among all we say HS Trop I is the best. Okay. Between Trop T and Trop I there is nothing much to choose. But for renal patients, it's Trop I that is always the best. But rate of rise is what is most important. Not a single value. It is rate of rise that is most crucial. 
Then patient came to the hospital within three hours of onset of chest pain. ECG revealed ST depression and anterior chest leads and T wave inversion. She is best managed by. So this is basically an unstable angina that you are actually talking of in this patient. If the enzymes are high in this patient, then we will probably put it as an NSTEMI. Every case of an NSTEMI, we start the patient with aspirin. We actually give the patient clopilate or ticagrelor. We give the patient statin and we also give the patient heparin or low molecular weight heparin because otherwise the underlying endothelium is still going to get further and further thrombosed and you're again going to have repeated, repeated infarctions. So this is what we do. And then we fix up a P emergency. We fix up a PCI, which is an elective PCI. We do an angiogram. We see the clots and if accessible, we actually go ahead and do a PCI. It's a very simple thing. There is no role for thrombolysis in NSTEM, it's very, very clear. There is no prophylaxis for arrhythmia required in acute management. PCI is not the management to be done then and there. It is actually, she's best to manage by is the question, but this is mandatory. Without doing this, there's nothing else. You have to do this, set up a PCI, and mostly you can do a PCI within the first 24 hours, or maybe even 24 to 36 hours. So that's a very straightforward question. So aspirin and heparin, aspirin, ticagrelor, statin with heparin. That's what we do. Okay, very, very easily discussed. 40 year old basketball player. Let's see this, this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is such a, such a favorite question. I would, that's what I again tell you. We can repeatedly, repeatedly read on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, repeatedly watch hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I think it might be a fuse. And I told you whether you know hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or not purely depends upon whether you know SAM or not. If you know systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve leaflet, you know everything about cardiomyopathy because SAM is the reason for everything. SAM is the reason for pulses bisphere and SAM is the reason for any kind of a dynamic obstruction. Everything is because of SAM. So if you know SAM, everything goes hand in hand. So ECG shows Q waves, T wave inversion, all these things we know, echo we know, so that's all there. So what is the pulse you see here? Pulses alternance is seen in LV failure, so no, I have any doubt. Water hammer pulse is seen in aortic regurgitation. Pulses bisphariance has three causes, severe AR, AR plus AS and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Why do you have the second wave? That is because of SAM. Okay, murmur. All murmurs decrease on Valsalva and standing. The murmur that increases on standing is basically your Hockham murmur. That is because the murmur is a dynamic one. The murmur is dependent upon three things. One is your preload. Anything that increases your preload will actually increase the cavity size, decrease the intensity of the murmur. Anything that decreases the preload will actually decrease the cavity size and increase the intensity of the murmur. Very, 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 very important. Similarly, increase the force of contraction. Whenever you have increased the force of contraction, that will increase the intensity of the murmur. Okay, so when you have a decrease in preload that increases the intensity of the murmur, you have an increase in force of contraction that increases the intensity of the murmur. That is why they are actually making the obstruction worse. Okay, they are making the obstruction worse. That's why we say or advise the patient to avoid things which increase the force of contraction. We advise patients to de prevent decreasing the preload. So don't give nitrates, don't make the patient dehydrated, don't give uh, things which increase the force of contraction like uh, digoxin. All these things are contraindicated. Is it okay? So, murmur increases on standing is right. Ejection systolic murmur is the right term for this murmur. Okay, it's a diamond shaped ejection systolic murmur as expected. Beta blockers are given for symptomatic relief. Beta blockers are given for symptomatic relief. That's correct. Beta blockers are actually the drug of choice. This is the same slide that I have used. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with symptoms, the drug of choice is beta blocker. If intolerant, you actually go for verapamil. And if the patient is not getting the desired results with beta blocker alone, then we add it as beta blocker plus disopyramide. Beta blocker plus disopyramide. Same thing I have taught you. If patient is refractory to this, then we go for surgical procedure like septal ablation, alcoholic septal ablation. Then we have also tried myomectomy and stuff which you can actually see. So basic drug of choice is beta blocker. If intolerant, we go for verapamil. And if not getting the, such, I mean, achieving results with beta blocker or verapamil, then we combine with disopyramide. So beta blocker is the best answer. Proper analog is what we generally use. Then comes when to actually put an ICD. This also we have actually discussed in very much detail. Mandatory 100% you have to put an ICD when the patient has had an episode of VT, sustained tachycardia VT or patient is actually giving a history of a sudden cardiac arrest before. Okay, so those things are mandatory. Then there are a few relative indications which also nowadays people are taking very seriously like family history you've had one or LV thickness is more than 30 millimeters, unexplained syncope the patient has had. So all these things are now being given a lot of weightage but the absolute indications if you ask me are prior you've had a cardiac arrest Second, you've had a sustained VT. So those are absolute indications. LV wall thickness, unexplained syncopes, family history are quite relative indications, but they are also being used. We have actually discussed the same slide also. Okay, so in this question, pulses bisphariance is right answer. Murmur increases on standing is right answer. Ejection systolic murmur is the correct answer. Beta blockers given for symptomatic relief is correct. ICD needed in special circumstances is right. 
Please go back and watch hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, restricted cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy and compare between them. Very, very important for the exam. So if you look at the cardiology questions also for the exam, I think almost every cardiology question has been actually taught and has been actually discussed. It's not going to be difficult for you to answer. Okay. So we're done with cardiology. So we move to neurology. Neurology this time around was very simple, very straightforward. There's nothing much complicated in neurology that they've asked. This is the first of the question, which is more of a pharmacology question. Absent seizures, we use valproate and ethosuximide. If you're 100% sure it's typical, you can use ethosuximide because we are not 100% sure. We keep using valproate because it has got multitude of effects on atypical absence and myoclonic and all these things. Okay. I want you to specifically go back and see the epilepsy module at the end of which we have actually graded them into different, different, different zones or classified them into different zones and given the list of first line drugs, the list of second line drugs. So in case you have a confusion with any of the drugs, like whether it has a use, whether it doesn't have a use, etc., you can go back and watch that. It's a big long thing, but I think it might be a few. Even Ranjan sir has given the same table uh, and trying to discuss which are the first line, the second line, etc. We have gone on and discussed very complicated things in that. This is very easy with respect to that. Okay. Second question, which is the following drugs exacerbates myasthenia gravis. This is very sad because I've discussed the same table. You can actually see at the end of my myasthenia discussion. The last slide in my myasthenia discussion is this one. Drugs exacerbating myasthenia gravis. And I have actually from this table given out the list of drugs which I thought are most important, which includes aminoglycan sites which includes macrolides which includes quinolones which includes local anesthetics which includes deep enzalamine which includes detubercularin and all these drugs i've actually given now the sad part of this in that is that i left out a drug that is magnesium but unfortunately in this question they have asked specifically for digene which basically contains magnesium so digene is something that can precipitate meropenem no because we're looking for aminoglycosides we're looking for quinolones and we're looking for macrolides we're not looking for beta lactams i've made very clear so meropenem is wrong lignocaine as i have very rightly mentioned local anesthetics and related drugs of course lignocaine is a very 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 important one there so lignocaine is correct digene is correct because it contains magnesium phenytoin though sodium channel blocker as per neurology textbooks and it's not implicated in worsening of myasthenia so i wouldn't take phenytoin digene you know, okay this is harrison's own table where you can actually see the big list of drugs and all of which i've discussed in my discussion on myasthenia gravis myasthenia gravis is a mighty important topic please do please do take some time and watch that module which is very important so we come to elderly woman on treatment for migraine Neons of chest pain without any previous history of angina and MI. So what can precipitate chest pain in a patient with migraine? And this is my slide on the same. Triptans are the drugs of choice and you can see Clinical efficacy of triptans depends on Tmax. It is ineffective in patients with migraine and aura. It is contraindicated in people with cardiovascular or cerebral vascular disease. The same thing has been discussed by me and Ranjan sir. We have actually brought up the same topic and discussed the same very important point that it can precipitate coronary or cerebral vascular occlusion. That is one major problem that you have with triptans. And the triptans that we use are either risatriptan or elitriptan because of its Tmax, nasal zolmitriptan and sumatriptan. And for severe attacks, we can use sumatriptan, 6 mg subcutaneous. So any of them, there's no big efficacy like that. Mild attacks, you can actually manage with an NSAID. Moderate to severe attacks, you require triptans. We use mostly risatriptan, elitriptan. And for severe attacks, we use 6 mg of cutaneous The major issue with triptans is its vaso-occlusive property. So this is basically got to do with triptan. And I've mentioned so many times what are triptans. They are 5-HT, 1B, or 1D agonist. So they are 5-HT, 1B, 1D agonist. Again, a pharmacology question. But if you've watched migraine, then it goes organically without you having to take any effort to study this this would come into place okay all the following are types of subcortical dementia except okay right at the beginning of dementia we have mentioned this that there are two types the cortical and the subcortical i've told you where the problem is in cortical alzheimer's disease and pix disease are the two examples that i brought about alzheimer's disease has got to do with your medial temporal lobe and your hippocampus that is it pix has got to do with your prefrontal cortex more than anything else because prefrontal cortex is connected to your corpus striatum by striatal fibers you can get few extra pyramidal features in pigs as well. Subcortical dementia, the classical examples is Huntington's disease. You can also get it in something like Parkinson plus syndromes. You can get it in Wilson's disease. All that is well explained. Memory, memory is the key point in cortical. Motor, motor and extra pyramidal features are the key points in subcortical. Memory plus aphasia, apraxia, agnosia. They are all cortical. Those things are not seen in subcortical. So please go back and study memory. Recent memory is the one that is in focus. It's a medial temporal lobe or what is basically called your hippocampus, which is called the gateway of memory that gets lost. Inside recent memory, you're asking me what is exactly getting lost. It is episodic memory that is getting lost or you're basically in distress because you're forgetting the episodes. As typically you have seen a person 
person last week who is related to your friend you know your friend because you've been knowing him for a long time but suddenly after one week you see that person you've forgotten that episode and you're still not able to say who he is and that puts you in extreme forms of distress so please watch the classification of memory as well as on where each one stands the very simple straightforward question Pick's disease is a cortical dementia not a subcortical dementia correct okay we move to all the following are true about subacute combined degeneration of spinal cord. Again, you can see the spinal cord module inside that. This B12 deficiency associated with subacute combined degeneration has been discussed right at the end. And wherein I have actually made a very important statement that Frederick's ataxia B12 and all this we've tried to combine. It is a spinal cord that gets predominantly involved in your subacute combined degeneration. Inside the spinal cord, it is the posterior column that gets involved. Then you have the corticospinal tract. Rarely you have the lateral spinothalamic tracts and last you have the peripheral nerve. So this is the complete order and that's why dorsal column and lateral tracts are getting involved is correct. Corticospinal tract is also a lateral tract. B12 improves the condition obviously correct. Now what is the next two? You go back to my discussion on approach to peripheral neuropathy and the different patterns of neuropathy that you can see in patients with element lesion. I have shown you these different different patterns. In that there is a pattern where you can see on the slide, this is a slide that I have projected in my video itself. Symmetrical sensory loss with distal areflexia and UMN features also. UMN features are actually due to spinal cord involvement. Distal areflexia is actually due to the peripheral nerve involvement. Symmetrical sensory loss is due to your sensory fiber involvement. You can see vitamin B12, you can see vitamin E you can see copper so copper vitamin E and vitamin B12 have so many things in common to each other very 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 important and that is why you keep on seeing this copper deficiency causes similar symptoms okay this has been again discussed all cases of neurological improvement show neurological impairment show macrocytosis now among the four options you can actually choose that as the answer but almost all the time you can actually see macrocytosis it's almost always goes hand but sometimes before the peripheral findings occur or before the peripheral smear findings are seen you get to see neurological impairment so that's why that's not a hundred percent correct answer all the others are hundred percent correct so among the options this is the better answer if you have seen the videos, you will be able to understand. And also under subacute combined degeneration, I've discussed this. I've discussed this in hematology also, where I've told you that some patients can have pure neurological involvement without hematological features. That's why this statement is the wrong answer. For this question, the correct answer, and obviously the wrong answer. Correct. Okay. So please, please go back and see the patterns. There are so many patterns that we have discussed of an axonal, of a demyelinating, individual examples for each. How is MND different from that? How is Frederick's different from that? How is Tebistorsalis different from that? Please go back and have an idea of these patterns. These are the rate limiting questions. They can actually take you for longs, for longs ahead. That's why we take pain in understanding. The last one question is pretty easy. This is a radiculopathy kind of question. This is again anatomy. So C5, C5 what this does, C6 what it does, C7 what it does, everything we've seen. C5 is got to do with your deltoid and basically your abduction. Okay, this has been discussed in detail. I told you radiculopathies, how radiculopathies are different from the neuropathies, what each radical does, and for each radical, what is the cornerstone value? L4, I told you. L4 is knee jerk, it's knee extension. Okay, when you think of S1, S1 is your ankle jerk or your ankle dorsiflexion. So each one has its own, its own particular thing. So C6 may be for your biceps, C7 for your triceps, etc. So C5 was the one, and that is deltoid. So neurology questions are actually very easy. Hematology questions for INICT 2020. Hematology questions for INICT 2020 was a mix. It was got. Uh, it has got a few things to do with uh, pathology. It has got a few things to do with medicine also. Let us start off with the first question, which is on nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's disease. So nodular lymphocyte uh, predominant Hodgkin's disease is actually classified separately from the original Hodgkin. Okay, because the culprit cell here is not the common. Reed Sternberg cell that you see, it is a lymphohistiocytic cell, what we call as the LH cell, and we also call it as the popcorn cell, okay, LH cell or a popcorn cell. How is this LH cell or a popcorn cell different? It is also a germinal center B cell, but the immunoglobulin somatic hypermutation in this particular cell is actually much more, and because of which this doesn't actually secrete cytokines. Because it doesn't secrete cytokines, you don't get B symptoms here. So there are absolutely no B symptoms. It is mostly a chronic asymptomatic lymphadenopathy that you get to see in these patients. Okay, that is very, very important. Second thing is the background. 
See, lymphoma itself, Hodgkin in itself is actually defined by the background. You get a mixed inflammatory background in classical Hodgkin. Here, the background is so very different. It is mostly comprising dendritic cells and a few T cells, etc. So, the background is completely different over here. Third point you get to see is that this lymphohistiocytic cell has an immunophenotyping that is completely different. You look at it, it is mostly CD20 and CD45 that is positive. It is CD15 as well as CD30 negative. So, that's again very, very, very important. And on top of this, you can see something called epithelial membrane antigen positive in this case okay epithelial membranes all this i've told you it is also bcl6 positive in many patients bcl6 positive and it presents most of the patients 75 percent of the patients here actually present in stage one or two stage one or two means they are presenting in a pretty early stage correct and that is why it is essentially got a very good prognosis also it's got a very good prognosis also and many a times or almost always this is EBV negative. This is EBV negative. So CD 1530 negative is right. CD 20 positive is right. EBV negative is right. Poor prognosis. No, this has got a much better prognosis. In fact, you take most of the patients come into stage 1 and 2. And if you look at these stage 1 patients who've got less bulky nodes, that means which got less than 10 centimeter in size and contiguous lymph node involvement, etc. They are actually treated with observation. And some people go for involved site radiotherapy. Even in stage 1 and 2 people who are having bulky nodes, most of the people go for involved site radiotherapy. The classical arch of that we use or the classical ABVD that you use is basically not used here. The RCHOP is being tried in patients who are having 3 and 4. Okay, not generally in 1 and 2. Okay, so it's a completely different class. So, poor prognosis is absolutely wrong. It has got a much, much better prognosis. You can actually see the slide also. LH or pop cell, CD20 positive, stage 1 lymphadenopathy B symptoms are actually very rare. In fact, you look at these patients, most of them are actually treated by observation. What is said is if you're having contiguous lymph node involvement with lymph node size less than 10 cm, you need not treat the patient at all. If you're having incontiguous lymph node involvement with bulky nodes, etc., you can treat the patient by involved site radiotherapy. That's it. That's more than enough. And advanced disease patients who are in 3 and 4 are basically being tried with RCHOP. Okay. So that is how the whole thing works. So it's a very, very important topic, Hodgkin. Nodal lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin into that is even more important. You need to know everything regarding this everything regarding nodular sclerosis mixed cellularity as well as our lymphocyte rich and depleted and i think this has been discussed by ila madam this has been discussed by me and we've discussed it thousand times so very very important topic we go to question number two what is the diagnosis in the given peripheral smear? See, please, please, please don't get it wrong. I told you the earliest finding you get in a B12 deficiency is a hypersegmented neutrophil. This is very important. You get macrocytes. Then you get start getting megaloblastic changes. You may get features of dyserythropoiesis like a Hubble Jolly Body or a cap out ring or something like a ring dyserythroblast, etc. But most important earliest finding that you get in a vitamin B12 deficiency is always, always a hypersegmented neutrophil and that has been discussed so many many times you can even get a hypersegmented neutrophil in mds also but then you're going to get so many other changes right you're going to get drink syndroblast you're going to get megaloblast you're going to get something like uh, what do you say pond ball megakaryocyte or you may be seeing nucleated cells fragmented cells so many so many dysplastic cells pseudo pelgar hewitt cells so many of them but here nothing it is only hypersegmented neutrophil that is shown over here it is b12 deficiency okay now, we go to question number three. This is the diagram that I had shown in class. The same. 20-year-old female presence of the EC fatigability and parlors. We're discussing with anemia over here. What is the most likely diagnosis? They have asked for most likely diagnosis. This is the image that I have shown. You can actually see the same image is there in your question bank also. This is an image that I have taken from the Slicinger's textbook of gastro in the chapter called Man Absorption where they have clearly discussed this. And the same image is actually come for the class. Hyperpigmentation is part and parcel of B2 deficiency. No more questions, no more answers. Okay, question number four, JAK2 mutation. Again, please, I've discussed this so many, many, many times. JAK2 mutations... Uh, you know, like we are discussing what is called chronic myeloproliferative diseases. So, if you look at chronic myeloid neoplasms on the whole, okay, you look at chronic myeloid neoplasms on the whole, you have myelodysplastic syndromes, you have myeloproliferative neoplasms, you have a combo of myelodysplastic bar myeloproliferative neoplasms. Three are there. MDS is characterized by dysplasia along all the three lineages, dysplasia along all the three lineages with a pancytopenia presentation. Myeloproliferative neoplasm is a terminal pluripotent stem cell with mature lineage actually going and proliferating. Under this, you have polycythemia rubra vera, you have primary myelofibrosis, you have CML, you have essential thrombocytosis. Now you have chronic neutrophilic leukemia, chronic eosinophilic leukemia, etc. Those are the things. MDS bar MPN are mostly used to describe the chronic myelomonocytic leukemia. Chronic myelomonocytic 
or you can even say juvenile myelomonocytic they all come under mds bar mpn so in this mpn group we are almost always talking about jack now in this jack polycythemia vera almost 97 to 98% of them are going to be jack positive primary myelofibrosis around 60 to 70 percent are jack positive essential thrombocytosis also around 60 to 70 percent of them are jack positive and you know in jack positive it is almost this valine being replaced by phenyl and what we call this v167f mutation that is the most characteristic one rarely few people have exon 12 mutations also so in people who are actually negative for this jack uh, v617f mutation you have to look for two more other mutations one is called your mpl gene mutation and the other one is cal reticulin gene mutation so in essential thrombocytosis as well as in primary myelofibrosis, 30 to 35% people are positive for MPL and cal reticulin. MPL is your thrombopoietin receptor and cal reticulin is also important. So they are seen around you know, 30 to 35%. So JAK2 mutation, if you look through, you will understand that in polycythemia vera 97 to 98, CML not seen, primary myelofibrosis around 60%, 65%, essential thrombocytosis also around 60%, 65%. Okay, that's how the whole thing is. And this is a very, very important topic. I told you so many important features with respect to this. These uh, chronic myeloproliferative neoplasms can transform into one another. They can transform into AML also. They are associated with significant degrees of marrow fibrosis. They have associated with significant degrees of extramedullary hematopoiesis. They have splenomegaly. Most of them have massive splenomegaly. ET has got a mild splenomegaly. PCRV has got a moderate to massive splenomegaly. All these things have been actually discussed. And also the JAK2 inhibitor called ruxolitinib. The use of ruxolitinib in PCRV the use of ruxolitinib in myelofibrosis. Okay, that's about it. Then comes, yes, a child brought to the ER with lesion on the forearm. You decide to excise the lesion emergency OT, which of the following will you do the entire coagulation pathway. Thromboelastography is a term that we have used at one point that is in our image-based discussions, MCQs, but we've not actually discussed what is thromboelastography. It's a pathology thing to be discussed in detail, but if you use basic common sense, entire coagulation pathway, if you want to know, then probably this is the answer. It's not something we've taught directly, but I think this is enough. And thromboelastography, the technique, etc. has been discussed by Elam Adam. I'm not actually going on to this. Which of the following conditions will have a least chance for dry tap on bone marrow aspiration very simple question which again many people got wrong it's your tendency to undergo fibrosis your tendency to undergo fibrosis where you have maximum risk for undergoing fibrosis we have maximum risk for undergoing fibrosis in myeloproliferative disorders primary myeloproliferative disorders especially marrow fibrosis then hairy cell leukemia very notorious in fact in that fried egg appearance diagram i've shown you i've actually told you very clearly as to there is significant degrees of fibrosis dysplastic megakaryocytes producing tgf beta always there is chance for fibrosis the same thing here aml m7 in aml very much significant chances for fibrosis and lymphomas generally are not associated with fibrosis because they don't have dysplastic platelets they don't produce tgf beta common routinely dlbcl or a barkit or something like a mantle zone to have fibrosis very very unlikely and that's why in this question you just have to bring everything into picture otherwise it's also a very simple question follicular lymphoma and fibrosis nothing nothing going together so which of the following can cause pancytopenia on a blood examination? It's a very simple question. We've discussed pancytopenia in length, breadth and volume, whatever way you can say. Pancytopenia evaluation starts with a bone marrow. Okay, Bone marrow aspiration, bone marrow flow, as well as your bone marrow biopsy, cellularity. Okay. Whenever you have an acute onset pancytopenia, first thing that comes to your mind is leukemia, 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 100%. It can be a myeloid lineage leukemia, it can be lymphoid lineage leukemia, also it could be a promyelocytic leukemia. Promyelocytic leukemia, younger patient, pancytopenia presentation, very classical. Especially this hypergranular variant, big cell, unable to come out of the marrow. You may not see the cell on the smear, but you will be able to see the cell on your marrow. And this is a patient who is going to respond very well to treatment, provided you start treatment on time, because this is notoriously associated with the DIC. And that is why early catastrophes are very common, so you have to cast the patient before that. So APML, very much, very much part of the scheme of things. So I told you. Acute leukemia is going to have a pancytopenia presentation. APML also can have a pancytopenia presentation. Remember that high risk variants of APML where the counts are very high because APML you divide into low risk intermediate risk and high risk based on platelet count and WBC. If WBC increases, it is supposed to be very bad in APML. That is your high risk type. Low risk and intermediate are the ones which are having lower WBC. Not lower WBC, less than 10,000 WBC. Okay, now... Then after that, of course, what comes to your mind next after leukemia, the second thing that comes to your mind for pancytopenia is MDS, always MDS. MDS generally has a cellular marrow. Sometimes you may have a hypocellular marrow also. So hypocellular marrow also very much part of MDS. Third, you can have an aplastic anemia that also is typically associated with a hypocellular marrow. Myeloproliferative diseases with a pancytopenia, especially primary myelofibrosis, very much part of your scheme of things. Then of course, hairy cell leukemia. Hairy cell leukemia can have a 
Pancytopenia, splenomegaly presentation. Megaloblastic anemia in 10 to 20 percent of patients can have a pancytopenia presentation. Post viral pancytopenia, especially post HIV, then you can have post TB. Even during active phase of TB, etc., you can have a pancytopenia presentation. Immunological conditions also, like SLD, can have a pancytopenia. Lymphoma with a leukemic phase can again have a pancytopenia. So, then some rare infections, etc., also. But on the whole, remember, these are the most important causes. And finally, for your exam, always keep in mind PNH. PNH is a very important cause. Generally, it's a high hypercellular marrow in PNH. Sometimes it can be cellular. Very rarely it can be a hypocellular marrow also. So on the whole, acute leukemia number one, MDS number two, aplastic anemia number three, myelofibrosis number four, Harris leukemia number five, then of course PNH number six and megaloblastic anemia 10 to 20 percent. That's it. Okay. So the answer here is not A, B and C. The answer is A, B, C and D. Okay. All the four can present with panserpine. This is your Harrison table which we have again discussed in detail. So this is the 14 month old child with HB 6.3, probable Thal major, last transfusion was given in 9 months, what is investigated, it's a tough question actually, because what we have studied is HPLC, you know, high performance liquid chromatography is what we studied and we have actually fixed our minds like that, globin gene sequencing is supposed to be better, I also came to know globin gene sequencing only after this question, so it's not something that we have taught, I think both the answers are correct, but as per pathologist, it is globin gene sequencing that is likely better, so this is the only one question where you have a doubt, the other questions are actually very very simple and straightforward, patient presents with cervical lymphadenopathy 11 for 14, what should be done to confirm the diagnosis? See, man, the same question was asked in AIMS also last time and everybody knows this 1114 transplantation is Mandel's own lymphoma. Mandel's own lymphoma is typically characterized by the presence of CD5, cyclin D1, BCL2 and SOX11 upregulation. Very, 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 very important. Elderly males, you get this. It is palpable lymphadenopathy. That is the most common presentation. Bone marrow involvement, not very common, but still you can see. And ileocecal lymphomatoid polyposis, all these things we have studied. So CD10, no. CD10 is a germinal center marker. This is CD10 negative. CD200, nothing. SOX11, cyclin D1. We have discussed Mandel's only more out and out. Okay. CD5 positive, 10 negative, 23 is actually negative here. CD5 positive, 10 negative, 23 when it becomes positive, you are mostly thinking of CL, not thinking of Mandel's only. Okay. That's about it. So, this is the monomorphic infiltrate of small irregular lymphocytes that you actually see here. So that's about hematology. Hematology is almost like we've done everything and we've almost got all. If somebody who's watched the hematology modules, hematology is something which I request you to watch because all they've seen pathology, clinical side, you have to have an angle to this. That angle is very difficult to obtain also because it is a different kind of a science. It's a science which is so totally different from the other medical subjects. The other medical subjects, I think in one way or the other, are very much connected to one another. This is more of a tech subject where you don't even have to touch the patient. You don't even have to touch the patient. Most of the decisions are actually made sitting and discussing sitting and discussing it is that kind of a subject so wherein the understanding has also got to be a little different we go to the last of the chapters infectious diseases where we have nine questions let us see question number one which is a middle-aged patient who's actually come with fever for four days rash on the anterior check wall next signs are seen no history of foreign travel no tick bite lumbar puncture is done csf report is clear nucleated 15 percent pmn sugar is 55 milligrams blood sugar at the time of sampling is 80 okay and RBC is not seen. So basically, you are looking for a sugar which is almost pretty much in range. So there is no decrease in sugar. So when I'm saying no decrease in sugar, then probably TB and bacterial meningitis, I have to keep it down, right? I have to keep it down because if it is TB or bacterial meningitis, sugars have to come down. 15% polymorph nuclear neutrophils, 50% nucleated, which means that probably it's a lymphocytic thing. And it is a four-day lymphocytic thing. If it were TB, it would be more subacute in presentation. And rash on the anterior chest wall again points to an acute viral exanthem. So virus, almost everything is fitting here. You are having a treated patient maybe with antibiotics. That's why you are having few polymorph nuclear neutrophils. Sugar is almost normal. They have not given the protein. So protein has to be slightly elevated. I think this looks like a viral meningitis. Pretty much looks like a viral meningitis. And... West Nile virus is not senior man. Enterovirus is the most common cause. It is enterovirus in CSF. I think that could be the answer I feel. It looks like a very simple straightforward viral meningitis. Nothing much. This question again has been discussed by me. Again discussed by Ranjan sir in detail in the Cyanide CT recall video. This is a CT revealing cysts. It is not just calcification. You are having cysts which means you have to actively treat the patient. And in a patient who is to be actively treated, you have to give steroids first starting from the day before you give the drug that is either albendazole sort of less than 2 cis or if more than that you give prasiquantel and then that has to be continued. So steroids followed by antiparasitic drugs, very, very simple, very straightforward question. Okay. 
Which of the following bacteria match the following bacteria with the drug of choice? Bacteroids, obviously, metronidazole. MRSA, obviously, vancomycin. Hemophilus, most of the time is penicillin sensitive. Very rarely only you have H influenza that is not penicillin sensitive. Klebsiella is most of the time extended spectrum beta lactam is producing. This we have discussed many, many times as with, uh, I mean, as with, so it's as to be responding to the extended spectrum drugs like a Piptas or a Meropenem or something like that. So from there we move to COVID. COVID obviously we are actually planning to launch a big new video on that with every subject separate separate that way. But right now for the exam we'll just see a few questions which I've not discussed obviously. But in the May section of AIMS recall that we had I think we discussed few points which have again come over here. Let's see what it is. So which of the following is not used in the management of severe COVID. Severe COVID I think all of you know severe COVID is steroid along with aspirin along with low molecular weight heparin. Interleukin 6 levels high means you can give tocilizumab. Remdesivir plus or minus. Moderate to severe COVID data for remdesivir but there are so many studies showing against also so it can be plus or minus so steroid obviously low molecular weight heparin obviously favipravir has no role just mild covid to reduce the viral loads you can try favipravir favipravir in severe covid has absolutely no role remdesivir is a plus or minus drug so probably you can put the answer as favipravir okay favipravir so definite role steroid low molecular weight heparin aspirin nothing else has got a, has got a significant role so dedicated COVID health center, you know, COVID health center, you need simple tools to actually assist the patient. Simple tools to assist the patient are oxygen saturation and respiratory rate. So they're assessed only on the basis of SpO2 respiratory rate. So it's only B and C that you are assisting the patient. In a COVID health center, assessment is purely on the basis of your respiratory rate and your SpO2. Drugs reducing mortality in COVID-19 patients. So in this particular question, there were so many options. So many people are giving so many options. But I'm telling you, there is only one drug that can reduce mortality so far proven in COVID. And that is that is only steroid. Rest, I don't know what are the options. But whatever the option is, that's wrong. It's only steroid, steroid, steroid. Because it is mostly like kind of a thrombotic microangiopathy in the pulmonary vasculature that is happening here. And that is the most common cause of lung injury, which is the diffuse alveolar damage, endothelial injury. Both are correct. The commonest cause for a lung injury, if you're asked, is endothelial injury. Most characteristic pattern of lung injury, if you're asked, is diffuse alveolar damage. I don't know what is the exact question. Commonest cause is endothelial. And characteristic pattern is diffuse alveolar damage. The same thing that I taught you in acute interstitial pneumonia. So we come to this question on dengue. Dengue practically right now is classified into dengue without warning signs, dengue with warning signs and severe dengue. Dengue without warning signs means you're having a fever, patient with fever, with rash maybe at the most and maybe having some headache or some leukopenia, etc. Dengue with warning signs means the hematocrit is just starting to rise, the platelet is just starting to fall, you're having persistent vomiting, ascites, abdominal pain, those patients are the patients with dengue warning signs. Severe dengue is severe plasma leakage, severe bleeding or organ dysfunction. So these are the three categories of patients you have. By the time the patient is going into defervescence, there is a time period, a very risky time period in dengue. That means the patient will have fever, 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 third day, fourth day, onwards, his fever starts to come down. Next three days is when he's at maximum risk. If he survives that, then everything is going to be fine. In those three days, you have to be extremely vigilant about two things. One is plasma leakage and second, of course, platelet count. These two things have to be taken with a lot of, lot of care. Now, in this patient, he has a hematocrit of 44, which is reasonably okay. Total leukocyte count 4,000, platelet count is 14,000 and he's having a piece so as far as platelet goes we don't take a chance my personal point on this and that's what infectious disease society of india also says if you have a patient who is having less than 10,000 platelet even if he's not bleeding transfuse 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 if he's having less than 20,000 platelets then even if he's showing the slightest symptom of bleed transfuse here this is a patient who comes between 10,000 to 20,000 but he's having epistaxis that means that he has to be has to be given plasma platelets, platelet-rich plasma. That is mandatory. Plasma leakage is very much part of this. So all these patients require IV fluids. If it's compatible, they need to be given plenty of oral fluids also. So next best step in management, if you are being asked, so then we are not taking in oral fluids. We are taking IV fluids with four units of platelet-rich plasma. So that's because less than ten thousand. Even if no bleeding, you transfuse ten thousand, twenty thousand. If there is bleeding, you transfuse more than twenty thousand. You can obviously wait, provided your platelet count is correct. It is being looked upon manually also and you are measuring the platelet count once in say 8 hours or so. Minimum once in 12 hours. And fluid, fluid, fluid all the way. Colloids and crystalloids, there's nothing much of a difference. So NS is more than enough. If it's not responding. Then some people say you can try dextran, But practically you have to give only IV fluids. So that's it. 
So these many questions have actually come from the discussions and you can see almost 95% of them have actually come from the video and inside that even if you have actually seen the video very casually okay or attended the class very casually still I think you will be able to answer the majority of them. Few questions have come on critical care also which is basically now anesthesia and medicine because anesthesia Chaitanya has discussed it well I am not actually going into it but now remember we have a new subject called DM critical care for which the qualification is either DM MD in general medicine or MD in anesthesia so it can be either the anesthesia side or my side but because I'm already exceeding time in every way I'm not going into critical care there were five questions one was on a high quality PCPR and in a high quality CPR always remember you know this no so one breathing per every six minutes which means that you have only ventilation at the rate of 10 breaths per minute so this is not 20 to 25 is definitely going to be wrong 100 to 120 chest compression correct 5 to 6 centimeters correct allow chest recoil obviously correct then how what do you do when you see a person when you see a person automatically you start checking for the carotid pulse absent you start giving CPR and then of course you connect the patient to an automated external defibrillator so obviously Obviously, start call for help, check carotid pulse and breathing and start giving CPR. Okay, then adrenaline and juice again so many times, so many times. Said cardiac arrest 1 in 10,000, anaphylaxis 1 in 1,000 and local anesthesia 1 in 1 lakh. Okay, this question again Rohan is discussed, again Chaitanya is also discussed, so and even Mayur is also discussed. So children, it still continues to be the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line, adults especially with bulky muscles etc, fifth intercostal space in the axillary line and followed by chest tube insertion. So that was it. So these are the critical care questions. It also had this high flow nasal oxygen, which was high flow nasal cannula that you can actually see being used in the COVID ICUs now. So these are the critical care questions. So if you sum up all these questions and actually put, even if you avoid the critical care questions, there was a question on QSOFA score also. And QSOFA score is also something that you can actually see in our discussion on infectious diseases, which includes your respiratory rate, which includes your BP and which also includes your mentation. All these things have been discussed. So basically, if you watch the videos from head to foot, just casually I'm saying that even in the time that you have left with you, you revise very well, you try to study the QBank well, you start doing GTs, everything. But when you feel low, when you feel low and when you feel like you want to take a break, you please randomly listen to some pulmonary embolism or you listen to some leukemia or you listen to something like a, a what do you say, myasthenia gravis. That will definitely hold you in good stead because it's something which we're discussing clinically. Question will also come in clinically. It is that one input that you're going to get from somewhere that's going to clinch the diagnosis that means that it is an irregularly irregular rhythm in the context of an abdominal pain that is giving you the clue for an atrial fibrillation with a mesentery ischemia so those clues are very important i feel this coming exam whenever it is is also going to be extremely clinically integrated as mayur sir has said there is only one way to study that is integrated study so try to watch the videos you're very clinical try to get it in a holistic way try to look at the question also in that fashion and just try to see what you would do with that patient if you look at it in that way, I think it's very easy. Exam paper, as far as INSCT concerned, is concerned, is a very, very realistic paper. It's a paper which is very much along the lines of what we expect. And students who scored good ranks are people who I felt have studied in a very simple, straight fashion. And uh, don't be too much bothered. Because don't be too much bothered in the sense, there are two kinds of sports. One like you play tennis, where your survival is of fate is determined by the quality of the serve that your opponent does. So it's something like you are pitted up against uh, Pete Sampras who is serving ace after ace. What can you do? You can't do anything. But arts is a different kind of a sport, which means I was, uh, I think in my MBBS when I watched Abhinav Bindra winning the first Olympic individual gold medal for India, it was in 2008 in Beijing. So after having won this prize in 10 meter air, I feel that's where he won this. When you asked him, what he said was very simple. In your, when you are in a sport like 10 meter air rifle and you are having this music coming to your ears and you are just focusing on your target, you are not aware of how the others are performing. Absolutely not aware. Only after you finish this off and then you look at the scorecard, do you see that, okay, you have scored this much, your opponents have scored this much. Okay, the same is applicable to medicine also. It's like shooting. That means we have only our target in mind. Others may shoot or not shoot. It's absolutely not important. So you just have your targets in mind. You just go about with that and just take it as a very, very positive race. And don't feel too stressed out and don't feel that this is like the ultimate, ultimate thing. Absolutely not like that. This is an entry point. So to get an entry ticket, we're just trying out. We're trying our best and we're studying in the most correct fashion. Okay, so there is still lots of time, lots and lots to play for. Please do not lose focus because as we are ending, entering into this space, it's very likely that you may lose focus. So please don't lose focus. Just try to study the best you can. When you feel demotivated, just listen to what Abbas has to say. So probably I think you may start feeling more motivated. That's also there. 
and for people otherwise you take it in a very very stable way and just try and go about with what you can actually do so always remember that studying one step above will go you in good stead because when you study at the same level when a question you see right in the middle of the exam you may not be able to actually deliver what is required so good luck guys keep continuing with your studies never ever fear what is studying is not going to be of use for the exam or whether this will come or it might come nothing just study in a very normal fashion don't over strain yourself have time for questions have time for exams come on have time for exams have time for videos have time for everything and balance it out in such a way that you feel happy at the end of the day when you go and sleep that okay i have studied so much that's fine that's more than enough and automatically you will actually reach where you have to okay so we have had a very very big vast discussion i don't know whether i have actually given uh, enough time to all the questions because if i start doing that this will never end but my last request is never skip on the mcq videos which we have done they have actually encompassed almost everything that is required for the exam and try and watch all the exam videos especially the ones from where top questions have come the topics from where questions have come the approach videos all those things which will be of will be giving you that kind of an edge going into the exam okay so good luck and hopefully you will be a pg in this particular coming year that is 2021 and that's probably i think one of your biggest biggest dreams so good luck and see you soon